It's day nine of Joseph Mann's expedition into the extreme wilderness of Antarctica. He's been following the tracks of a mysterious creature, a massive, anomalous beast that has been spotted in the snowy wastes. As he follows the tracks, he sees something. It's his own tent, but he had been walking for days after leaving this camp. How was he back here after only a few hours? Time and distance were starting to feel off, like they were stretched out and folded over into knots. Maybe he was confused about the tracks. Maybe he hadn't been chasing after something, but following the tracks of something that had been chasing him. Maybe he was wrong about everything. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-2764, also known as the Eldritch Antarctic. SCP-2764 is a massive biological entity, standing over 380 meters tall and estimated to weigh over 150,000 metric tons. It possesses around 80 tentacle-like arms that it uses for movement and simple actions like grasping objects. It also has what looks to be a head with four eyes. SCP-2764 possesses a number of anomalous properties, including the ability to communicate telepathically with humans, though the language used changes based on the person who is receiving its messages. Strangely, this communication appears to go one way only, as it has never demonstrated that it understands any attempts to communicate back to it. Its physical state has also been observed to be quite anomalous. Its size does not follow normal Euclidean geometry, with the creature appearing many times larger or smaller than it should based on the viewer's distance from SCP-2764. There appears to be a critical zone lying roughly 50 kilometers away from the creature that stretches around it in a circle. As you move away from the creature and approach this line, SCP-2764 actually appears to grow larger until the critical zone is passed, at which point it begins to shrink as you move farther and farther away. Its body has a number of other strange properties too. Its tentacle-like arms rapidly translocate around its body at random intervals, jumping around all over its body creating a twitchy, writhing mass that makes it impossible to count how many tentacles it actually possesses. But perhaps strangest of all is that not only do the creature's arms seem to break the laws of physics by jumping around its body, but so too does the entirety of SCP-2764. It's been observed to spontaneously relocate itself to different places, as if it is flickering in and out of existence. It appears that the creature flickers into a new place like this at random intervals, but it may be following some yet unknown rules, as it has never been seen appearing more than 25 kilometers away from where it was last seen and always flickers back to its original location within 48 hours. SCP-2764 was first discovered by a civilian team that was conducting detailed surveys of the Antarctic landscape. The team observed the creature, and were immediately alarmed by its strange properties, especially its bizarre geometric qualities. They returned to their home base and described what they had seen to a colleague, who was actually an SCP Foundation researcher in charge of investigating anomalous activity in Antarctica. This researcher sent word back to his superiors, who activated Mobile Task Force Eta-5, also known as the Jaeger Bombers. Eta-5 administered amnestics to the survey team and any other exposed civilians before setting up a perimeter around SCP-2764. What they would eventually learn was that the perimeter they established was far too close. In his investigation logs, MTF-805 Commander Joseph Mann noted that he immediately experienced strange anomalous effects, such as how the creature seemed to shrink the closer he got to it, and the strange voices in his head. His curiosity soon got the better of him, and he decided to do some of his own research into the entity before the rest of the SCP Foundation scientists and guards arrived to take over the investigation. Man gathered a couple volunteers who were also curious about the nature of the anomaly and set out on an expedition to gather more information. Just as they had experienced before, the more they walked towards the creature, the more it appeared to shrink in size. They also made note of strange prints in the snow. At first, they looked to be human prints, but then seemed to change into something that looked as if a squid had pulled itself onto the land and was dragging itself through the snow. After several days, the whole team was hearing voices. They also realized they had left their tissue analyzer back at a previous camp and would have to backtrack to retrieve it. As they moved away from the creature, they expected it to now increase in size, but it didn't. It stayed the same. Either something had changed about the anomaly, or SCP-2764 was moving towards them. 
After recovering the tissue analyzer, they continued on towards the creature again. Commander Mann began to understand the voices he was hearing and could even make out certain words like snow and back. Their perception of time was affected too. Hours seemed to stretch out or pass by in the blink of an eye. The voice he was hearing started to become more direct and the message was clear, turn back. Mann was compelled to press on though, even with the extremes of the Antarctic cold beginning to weigh on him. But then, SCP-2764 suddenly vanished, flickering out of existence, and the team was left with no choice but to follow the strange tentacle-like tracks in the snow, hoping they would lead to the creature. The tracks led them back to their old tent, the same one they had left the tissue analyzer at before, which should have been impossible based on the time and distance they had walked. Just then, Commander Mann realized that he had been wrong. They were the ones who had been pursued. They hadn't been following the tracks forward, but backwards to where they had been. Even worse, he realized that his team had disappeared. He was completely alone. Commander Mann continued to trudge through the snow, walking without direction, when he spotted SCP-2764 again. It was circling him, trying to maintain its distance, but he raced towards the creature and sliced off a piece of its flesh for analysis. Something strange happened when he placed it in the analyzer though. The machine displayed a zero, which was the reading for human tissue. This strange result required further analysis from the Foundation researchers who should now have arrived to take over the investigation, so Mann began to make his way back in the direction of home. He spotted what looked to be members of his team off in the distance, and assumed that they must be on a mission to rescue him. Try as he might though, the spatial anomalies prevented him from ever getting closer. It felt like it would take him an entire day just to walk a few feet. He assumed it must be the same for his rescuers, as he watched them off in the distance, seeming to never get closer. At one point, he could even see as they stopped and turned back, appearing to return to an old campsite. He couldn't understand what they were doing, but then they disappeared entirely, only to reappear much closer to him. Commander Mann, now sure that there was something terribly wrong happening, tried to approach the now single rescuer he could see to tell him to turn back, but before he could. The man rushed at him with a knife and cut a piece of his flesh from his back. It's at that point that Commander Man finally started to understand. He hadn't been watching a rescue team come for him, he'd been watching himself. He had been walking towards the creature, and yet at the same time, he had also always been the creature. Commander Man was trapped in a time loop where he was doomed to transform into the monstrous SCP-2764 and then watch himself meet the same fate over and over again forever. The voices he had been hearing telling him to turn back were his own, words of warning that he was doomed to always ignore. SCP-2764 has been classified as Keter and is currently located in a classified area of Antarctica. A 150 kilometer radius has been established around the object, which is to be monitored at all times by Mobile Task Force 8 of 5. Any civilians that come within the 150 kilometer radius either by accident or due to SCP-2764 flickering to a populated area are to be administered Class A amnestics, and any civilians that may have knowledge of the event are to be administered Class B amnestics. Should any civilian or Foundation employees come within 30 kilometers of SCP-2764, they are to be detained and immediately questioned. Following their psychological examination and depending on the results of the evaluation, they will either be administered Class A amnestics or terminated. It is the mid-19th century, in a village not far from St. Petersburg, Russia, where a sideshow carnival has been set up. There are a number of tents displaying various attractions, a man juggling fire in front of one. In another, a large bear balances on top of a ball. A detective from the St. Petersburg police force has been led here in the course of his investigation into the disappearance of a local chess prodigy's twin daughters. He had heard a rumor that the girls may be here, and he could easily imagine a kidnapping victim forced to perform as part of this seedy traveling circus. After passing by a contortionist and a man throwing knives at a woman strapped to a board, he found what he had been looking for, a large tent with a hand-painted sign reading, The Samurai, See the Unbeatable Chess Automaton. The detective had heard about these kinds of shows, and had even seen one himself. They would claim that their mechanical contraption could somehow play chess and beat even the best grandmasters without any human assistance, but the detective knew their secret. Inside was a person, 
cleverly hidden in such a way that you'd have no idea from the outside. But there was always someone in there, pulling on strings or levers to manipulate the machinery as the crowd looked on amazed at the feats technology was capable of. And who better to hide inside one of these charlatan boxes than a small girl who had already shown an incredible aptitude for chess. Two girls were even better than one. They could work together or take turns playing in shifts. The detective had the feeling in his gut that had yet to be wrong. The girls were in that machine. The detective enters the tent housing the automaton, but is stopped at the entrance and told that he has to pay if he wants to see. The smoky, lamp-lit tent is crowded with men all huddled around something in the center. A burst of cheers come from the throng, and again the man demands payment for entrance, poking the detective in the chest, telling him he has to pay or get out. The detective asks if he's the owner of the machine, but the man says he's just the exhibitor. He again stresses that the man has to pay or he'll be forced to leave, again punctuating his point with a stern poke to the chest. As the man pokes the detective again though, the detective grabs his hand and twists his arm behind his back. He asks again who the owner of the machine is, but the exhibitor, through gritted teeth, tells him he really doesn't know. He only communicates through letters and doesn't know the owner's real name, or even what he looks like. The detective shoves the man aside and heads deeper into the tent. He enters the crowd of men, pushing them aside, and finally sees what everyone has been so amazed by. There in the middle of the room is a chessboard on top of a steel table connected to a small steam engine. Sitting next to the table is a stationary suit of samurai armor, and across from that is a Russian man who appears to be deep in thought. He is playing chess, and his game against the samurai does not look to be going well. The detective sees the man make his move, and then, almost instantaneously, a piece moves by itself across the board in response. The man buries his head in his hands. Checkmate. The crowd erupts in cheers as the detective makes his way to the table. The exhibitor is rushing towards him, trying to stop the detective as he inspects the samurai suit. The suit falls to the ground. It's empty. The exhibitor is pulling on the detective, pleading with him to leave. The detective knows the girls are in here, though, if not in the suit of armor, then under the table itself. The detective grabs the chessboard and pulls. To his surprise, it comes off easily. And underneath is machinery. A complicated series of tubes, magnets, and gears whir and hum with electric current. The detective can hardly comprehend what he's looking at until he spots it. There in the middle of the machinery are two glass jars, connected to the rest of the device by wires. There's a pink blob of organic material in each jar. Brain matter. And they are labeled with the missing girl's names. This is SCP-1875, also known as the Antique Chess Computer. SCP-1875 is a chess automaton from the Victorian period that is made up of four main components. The first of which, SCP-1875-1, is a steel table measuring 72 centimeters by 72 centimeters by 64 centimeters, with a standard 8x8 chessboard painted on top. Inside the steel box is a sophisticated piece of machinery that combines mechanical and biological elements. The movement of the pieces comes by way of magnets, with the moves themselves appearing to be decided by an analytical engine. Integrated into the analytical engine is brain tissue from the twin 14-year-old daughters of a Russian chess prodigy who went missing during the 19th century and were never found. The pieces, which have been designated SCP-18752, form a standard 32-piece chess set and are carved in an oriental style. The pieces have magnetic bases, and the tops have been identified as being carved human bone and genetically matching the brain tissue in the machine. SCP-18753 is a small steam engine with variable speeds that is connected to the machine via a drive shaft. SCP-18754 is a suit of 18th century Gusoku-style samurai armor. The armor appears to have no actual connection to the machine, mechanical or otherwise, and it now seems as though the armor was merely a prop. Though multiple Foundation researchers have reported feeling a sense of unease and anxiety after making eye contact with the suit's mask. SCP-1875 continues to be fully operational and even has adjustable difficulty levels depending on which speed the steam engine is set to. To test the chess-playing abilities of the machine, 
A D-Class personnel was seated at the machine across from the samurai, and moves that were decided by chess software were broadcast into the room. Games were played on each of the machine's five settings, and the chess software was used to measure SCP-1875's estimated rating on the ELO system, which is a method used to calculate the relative skill of players, with a higher number being better. At the first setting, the machine exhibited a chess-playing ability that would be rated in the 800 to 1000 range, which would be the equivalent of someone who knew how to move the pieces correctly, but otherwise was laughably bad. The second setting produced a result closer to 1200, which would put it firmly in the novice category. The third setting improved the automaton's ability to anywhere between a 1200 and 2500 rating, which meant that it could perform like an amateur all the way up to a master level. The fourth setting, though, was where the machine became truly incredible, and operated above a 2500 ELO rating. At that level, it would play like a chess grandmaster, and sometimes operated at a level higher than any human has ever been recorded. The fifth and final setting was baffling, though. The machine would play erratically, sometimes at a level even higher than that measured on the fourth setting, but then in the next game would make nonsensical decisions or look like it was trying to lose, sometimes even making moves that were illegal. Multiple games were played at this setting, and the amount of illogical moves only increased. The pieces began to move faster and faster, and eventually they began to ram together until several were chipped. The testing was quickly halted after this and further tests were suspended until a way to test without potentially damaging the pieces was found. Following this bizarre result, something even stranger happened. Five minutes after the test, an email was received by all members of the SCP-1875 email distribution list. The message, which appeared to come from a research analyst involved with 1875 research, consisted only of a single image, which has been classified as it is suspected of having dangerous memetic properties. Multiple members of staff opened the email, leading them to unintentionally view the attached image, and soon after reported numerous symptoms. They would immediately begin feeling anxiety, followed by a headache and fever. Two hours after viewing the image, they would begin feeling restless, unable to sleep, and hear auditory hallucinations. After four hours, visual hallucinations would begin as well. After seven hours, while still awake, they'd be exhibiting less and less response to stimuli. After 11 hours, there would be only brief periods of lucidity, during which the afflicted person would appear to recover completely and immediately demand access to the computer on which they originally observed the image. After 12 hours, well, it only gets worse from there. SCP-1875 has been classified as Euclid, and the most important aspect of its containment is that it never comes within transmission range of a wireless data network of any kind. To help ensure this, the anomaly is kept contained within a Faraday cage at all times, and a network security expert is always on site. During testing, the steam engine's speed is only to be placed on one of the first four settings, and never the fifth. This rule became necessary following a test at the fifth level, after which a laptop computer was introduced into the Faraday cage to see if new research material would be transferred onto the computer similar to how the memetic image appeared. It seems, though, that the laptop used was somehow infected and spread its virus to the entirety of the site's computer networks. All electronic communications with the facility were strictly forbidden by the O5 Council itself, which shows just how dangerous this could be. No electronic communications of any kind would be allowed until it can be determined just how SCP-1875 is transmitting its extremely dangerous memetic image, and how it can be prevented. In the future, should any staff come to unintentionally view or open an email that contains shachmate.exe, they are to immediately… Mm. Ah. Ah, what happened? No, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, are we still recording? Yeah, no, I can take it from, uh... Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and make sure... Make sure you subscribe, and turn on notifications, so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. I think, um, I'm going to go lie down. Candace Hayes, we have thy confession. 
A witch as brazen as you shall be burned at the stake. The crowd gathered in the small room bursts into a cheer as the judge hands down the sentence. The accused woman doesn't react, though. She looks neither scared nor afraid, but simply resigned to her fate. No time is to be wasted in carrying out the punishment that the judge has decreed. A pair of constables grab the woman by the arms and take her away. A mob follows along as the woman is led through the town, taunting and jeering, calling her a witch, a wife of Satan, and worse names. She doesn't seem affected by them, though. In fact, she looks as if she can't even see them. Her attention is focused solely on one mysterious woman who walks along with the crowd, and yet somehow seems disconnected, as if she isn't truly there either. The two women maintain eye contact as the constables keep pushing the condemned woman along. They lead the woman outside of town to a tall hill. The ropes binding the woman's hands are cut, and she has just a moment to rub her sore wrists before she is forced to the ground and lashed to a piece of wood as another group tosses the last logs onto a nearby pile. Once she is securely tied down, the constables step away, but then another man wearing a hood approaches. He carries a large club and without hesitation begins beating her legs. The woman's composure finally breaks and she cries in pain from the cracking of her bones. The crowd only cheers louder at the screams from the witch. The beating has left the woman's legs mangled, but this is far from over. The woman, still strapped to the wood, is placed on the pyre, where she hangs like a scarecrow above the combustible material. The judge steps forward out of the screaming mob, carrying a torch. He loudly exclaims that for her crimes, she will be burned until dead. But the judge doesn't step forward. He instead announces that another will have the honor of lighting the flame. Another man steps out of the crowd and takes the torch from the judge. He walks towards the pyre and looks up at the woman. She is exhausted from the beating, but she lifts her head. She doesn't look at the man with the torch, though. She's looking past him, locking eyes with the mysterious woman who walked along with the crowd. The man looks angry, slighted that she won't even meet his eyes in this final moment, and without another moment's hesitation, he tosses the torch onto the pyre. The wood lights instantly, the tinder combusting and turning into a huge roaring fire. The crowd also erupts into even louder cries of celebration as the woman screams from inside the blaze. The man watches as the woman is lost behind the fire and the smoke, and eventually her cries too are hidden behind the crackles and pops of the flames. He doesn't move until the fire has nearly burned itself out. Most of the crowd has left at this point, having gone back to their homes content with the role they played in doing the Lord's work. As the constables pull a charred torso down from the wood and unceremoniously toss it over a steep side of the hill, the man finally turns and starts to walk away, a tear rolling down his cheek. The judge approaches and places a hand on the man's shoulder. There, there, the judge says, attempting to comfort the man. You'll find a new wife soon enough. Hundreds of people were accused of witchcraft in colonial America, and while it is likely that many were falsely accused, there is reason to believe that some were under the influence of, or were themselves, what we now describe as anomalies. And SCP-3998 is just such an example, better known as The Wicker Witch Lives. SCP-3998 is a human cadaver which dates from the late 17th century that is covered in fourth-degree burns and is missing its legs. There is also evidence of extensive blunt force trauma, but it is not known if the beating or the burning was the ultimate cause of death. At some point, the remains were collected and fastened into a scarecrow that is held together with wicker, nails, and wire. While a scarecrow fashioned from a cadaver is rather unconventional, what brought SCP-3998 to the SCP Foundation's attention were its other anomalous attributes. It constantly secretes a flammable liquid from its bones that primarily consists of ethanol and human fat, and every night between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., the corpse ignites. This fire doesn't cause any damage to the corpse, though, and it is unknown how it produces the flammable liquid or ignites. 3998 does not keep its flames to itself, though. It appears that the SCP targets those who have either killed or physically abused a romantic partner, causing them to catch fire as large quantities of boiling ethanol appear in their stomach. Their midsection will eventually melt and then explode, leading to amputation of the lower half of their body. 
The fire burns both incredibly hot and unnaturally fast, and is unable to be put out until SCP-3998 is extinguished. A number of historical documents related to the case have been discovered and made available to Foundation researchers that shed light on SCP-3998, including excerpts from a 17th century diary belonging to a woman who lived near where the cadaver was discovered. In the entries, the woman describes attending the wedding of her neighbors, Aidan and Candace Hayes, though Candace did not seem especially happy with the arrangement. Candace is characterized as someone who likes to keep to herself and who does not conform to the era's idea of a good wife. As a result, it appears that she became the victim of abuse at the hand of her husband. The diarist hypothesizes that Candace has brought this fate upon herself due to her behavior, which may stem from her being under the hold of the devil. In other words, the neighbor believes that Candace is a witch. Others must have had the same suspicion, because we also have records of Candace's interview with a Judge William Stoughton, who questioned her about the accusations of consorting with evil spirits. Candace readily admitted to this, though she disagreed that it was in any way evil. She told the judge that the rituals and magics she practiced were not inherently good or bad, and that anyone was capable of using the same tools. She went on to explain that she hated her husband, that she had been forced to marry him, and that he had been nothing but cruel and violent towards her. Candace also mentioned a name, Clovis, that the judge assumed to be the demon that she had made her cursed pact with. Candace appeared to offer no defense or excuses for her actions, and the judge sentenced her to die by burning at the stake, with her husband, Aiden, being the one to light the fire. The story of this witch trial was typical of the time, and that likely would have been the end of what we know about SCP-3998. But another historical document was located that has truly given a new perspective to this anomaly. A sealed letter found in the cellar of a home that is addressed to Candace, though it appears to have been written after her death. The letter is from her secret lover, and describes how they collected Candace's burnt bones from the bottom of the hill before binding them together with wicker and wire. The letter then describes how Candace's husband has recently restocked his own home with gin, which is well known to be extremely flammable. The letter ends with an affirmation of the writer's eternal love for Candace and is signed, Clovis. But perhaps the best information we have about the origin of SCP-3998 comes from an obscure local tale that was passed down orally for years and eventually documented on an urban legend website. The legend tells of a woman who promised her soul to a she-devil who taught her magic but also offered companionship. When her husband found out, he contacted the local authorities and had the woman arrested. She was tried, her legs were broken, and she was hung up like a scarecrow before being burned alive. Her body was dumped off the side of a mountain, but the she-devil collected her bones and gave her life again. The need for revenge burned in the woman's heart, so in the middle of the night, she doused herself in her husband's gin, set herself on fire once more, and fell upon him as he slept, burning him alive so he could suffer the way that she did. SCP-3998 is currently held in a secure holding locker in Site-34 that is fireproofed and vacuum sealed to prevent it from igniting. Every morning at 9 a.m., 3998 and its locker are cleaned to remove the secretions of flammable liquid. D-Class personnel who have been convicted of domestic abuse crimes are to always be kept at the site to ensure that they are the targets of SCP-3998, which when it's not allowed to ignite, will result in them only feeling mild discomfort in their head and chest rather than spontaneous combustion. Due to its relatively easy method of containment, SCP-3998 has been classified as safe. However, recent developments have caused the Foundation to rethink this classification. Despite 3998 being securely contained, the number of arson-related homicides in the state of Massachusetts have actually increased following containment with many showing the same damage to their body as would be expected in a victim of SCP-3998. And while it may be that these are the result of a yet uncaught serial killer who simply happens to employ similar methods of killing their victims, a recent re-examination of the SCP-3998 corpse has revealed more troubling details. The body of SCP-3998 does not belong to Candace Hayes, and in fact appears to be a male who was in his 30s at the time of his death. Following these new revelations, reclassification of SCP-3998 to Euclid is pending. Whether SCP-3998 is the body of Candace's husband Aiden, forced to endure an eternal punishment of burning again each and every night, or if it's some other unfortunate victim of a violent and painful death, is unknown. 
as is the ultimate fate of Candace and Clovis. But with the deaths that would appear to be attributable to SCP-3998 showing no signs of stopping despite containment, it can only be assumed that the Wicker Witch lives. It's late on a Saturday night in New York City, 11.55 p.m. to be exact. A man is running towards the subway station on 59th Street. He's just gotten off from work at the restaurant where he waits tables, and he's in a hurry to get home and spend some time with his girlfriend. As he approaches the station, he notices something strange. Someone has placed a wooden barrier in front of the entrance. The man has never seen something like this before, but he hasn't lived in Brooklyn very long. Everything about the station looks normal behind the barrier, and he's in a hurry. He doesn't want to have to go several blocks to the next station, so he hops the barrier. What's the worst that could happen? As the man walks onto the train platform, he starts to second-guess his decision. The platform is empty, and come to think of it, he hasn't seen anyone in the station at all. Maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe the station really is closed for repairs. He turns around to leave, but just as he does, he hears a train. Good. Everything is normal. He checks his watch. 11.57 p.m. on the dot. The train comes to a stop, and its doors slide open. It looks a little older than the trains he usually rides, but it appears to be in perfect shape, and it's going the direction of his home, so he steps on board. Just like the station and the platform, there's no one else on the train. Strange, but he's ridden nearly empty trains before, especially late at night, though usually at this time on a Saturday there's at least a few people on board. Just then, he hears something in the station. He turns to see someone running down the platform crying out. Stop! Stop! The man in the mass transit authority vest cries, dropping what looks to be his dinner on the platform as he runs. While the MTA worker is still several feet away, the doors snap shut and the train begins to move. The MTA worker cries out again to stop, but he knows there's no point. He watches as the train heads down the tracks and disappears into the darkness. With a sigh, he takes out a walkie-talkie and it squawks to life. We've lost another one, he says. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-052, also known as the Time Traveling Train. SCP-052 appears to be a standard-looking Type R4 New York City subway train. Official city records state that the train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Despite the fact that it should no longer exist, SCP-052 continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at exactly 11.57 p.m. every Saturday night. The train appears to be in perfect condition, just the same as when it was built over 80 years ago, and it is marked as an A-train. Each Saturday, the train arrives at exactly the same time, opens its doors to accept or discharge passengers for precisely five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears until the next week. Where did the train come from? And where does it go in between the weekly appearances? These are questions the SCP Foundation is trying to answer. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of SCP-052 is that once you get on the train, there's no guarantee of ever getting off. Sadly, the majority of subjects that have been observed boarding SCP-052 have not been heard from again. The rare few that have been recovered claim to have boarded the train on various dates, ranging from 1976 all the way to the year 2204, with the latter claiming he thought he was boarding a special 300th anniversary train. Thus far, none of the recovered passengers have reported any memories or knowledge of their time on board the train between entering and exiting. Any passengers spotted disembarking from SCP-052 are to be immediately brought to Site-21 for questioning to determine their origin and assess whether they pose any threat to the current time stream. The Foundation has had great success administering Class A amnestics to passengers who arrived from the past and reintegrating them into society. But any passenger who is identified as being from the future must be held indefinitely to prevent potential disruptions to this reality's time stream. Per Order 69-A1 from O5 Council Member O5-9, there are currently 26 recovered passengers being held at Site 21 who fit this description, and there are not yet any procedures in place that would allow for their safe release into modern society, nor has there been any workable theories for how to return them to their original home time. Despite the protocols in place to prevent public access, 
Some passengers from the present have still managed to accidentally board SCP-052, and subjects from other times continue to appear. Following interviews, it's been discovered that some of these subjects arrive from alternate timelines and realities. This raises the question of whether it is possible for SCP-052 to appear in other times and places, which may require the containment of additional locations, and reports of any suspicious activity involving unscheduled trains are being monitored and investigated around the world. Following its initial discovery, several tests were attempted in order to better understand the anomalous train and what may be happening when it is no longer visible. The first test took place on May 31, 2009. An agent was told to simply board the train. They did as requested, and have yet to be recovered as of the present date. A second test took place a week later on June 6. This agent too was never recovered, though reports indicate that he may have returned to our timeline in 1980, at which point he was killed in a confrontation that has since been classified. A third test was conducted the next week on June 13th. Once again, the agent was told to board the train and did so. This time, though, the agent returned. Just two weeks later, on June 27th, the agent stepped back off the train, with his hands appearing to have been surgically removed. A note had been placed in his pocket that had the simple message, Send No More, written on it. The agent claims not to remember any of his experiences on the train over the two weeks he was gone, or what may have happened to his hands. Following this third test, O5 Command issued orders stopping the use of Foundation agents as passengers on SCP-052. D-Class, due to their disposable nature as convicted felons and death row inmates, were considered as potential replacements for the agents in the exploration of SCP-052, but the risk of releasing them into the past or the future was determined to be too great. Other than the agent who knowingly boarded the train, several other notable passengers have been recovered. One case involved the recovery of a woman who entered the train on July 14, 2012, but was recovered four years earlier, on March 8, 2008. She entered the train while on her way home from the theater, and was surprised to learn she traveled four years into the past. Because another version of her existed at the time she was recovered, she was held to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Another subject was recovered in 2008 who claimed to be from the year 1976. Although there was nothing physically wrong with him and no risk of time stream disruptions, Foundation psychiatrists recommended that he be held indefinitely, as 32 years was believed to be too long a period of time to successfully reintegrate into society. Perhaps the most interesting recovery was of a man claiming to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who boarded the train in December of 2124. He said that he had been administered a Class A amnestic prior to boarding and remembered nothing until his recovery in 2010. While the agent can clearly never be released into society, O5 Command has approved the sharing of classified information about various anomalies, in the hopes that he can provide additional information on possible containment procedures. Because SCP-052 has so far proven impossible to stop or remove from the New York City subway system, it has been classified as Euclid but its predictable nature means that the Foundation is usually able to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is closed to the public between 11 p.m. on Saturday night and 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, under the pretext of track maintenance. Any passengers seen leaving SCP-052 must be taken to Site-21 for debriefing and processing, and members of the public who simply see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. As for what happens to most of the passengers who board SCP-052 and are never seen from again, we simply don't know. As you can clearly see, this completely throws our entire understanding of our place in the universe into complete disarray, says the astronomer as he excitedly makes his case to a panel of aged and supposedly learned advisors. My observations leave no doubt that everything we previously suspected to be the absolute truth is wrong. The panel of advisors murmur and lean close together to whisper to each other. The astronomer can't hear what they are saying, but the passion and joy that he felt as he explained his findings to the room is quickly draining from his face. He can see the men mouthing the words, no, and lies, as they make disapproving gestures. But how could this be? Had they not understood what he was showing them? Maybe he didn't explain things in a way that they could comprehend. Here he was, the greatest scientist of his day, 
presenting hard facts backed up by rigorous observations, and this was their reaction. The group of advisors finish conferring and grow quiet. The chief advisor clears his throat, and everyone in the room waits for him to speak. Royal scientist, this panel has examined your findings and listened to your theories. The advisor can't help but sneer at the word, and has decided that the ideas you present are not only incorrect, but dangerous. The astronomer can't believe what he's hearing. This panel, acting under the authority of the king, has charged you with the crime of heresy. The astronomer is shocked. He steps towards the panel to plead with them, but he's stopped by a pair of guards who grab him by the arms. Stop! Stop! I'm a man of science! I only presented you with the truth! But no one seems moved by his appeals. The panel watches as the astronomer is dragged from the room, kicking and fighting, still insisting on his innocence. The screams echo through the dungeon as the torturer cranks another notch on the rack, stretching the astronomer's body just a little bit more. He has no idea how long this has been going on. Hours? Days? The pain has been excruciating and without end. He closes his eyes, trying to escape the torture by retreating into his mind, but he's slapped on the face and brought back to the reality of his situation. Standing in front of him is the chief advisor, the same one who sentenced him to this inhumane treatment. You can end this any time you like. Simply recant your statements and admit you were mistaken, and all of this will be over. The astronomer is unsure if by over he means that they will release him or simply kill him to put him out of his misery. But it didn't matter which the right answer was, he couldn't lie. The astronomer knew the truth, and no amount of pain, no matter how intense or how long they submitted him to it, would change what he now knew. Disappointed with the astronomer's steadfastness, the advisor signals to the torturer, who cranks the rack again, stretching the astronomer's body to the point where he feels like his bones might pop out of their sockets. Recant, the advisor screams, repeating the word over and over, growing louder as the astronomer's own cries increase from the pain caused by the torturer cranking the rack more and more. The astronomer closes his eyes again. He's certain this will be the end of him soon and that he will die with the great secret he's learned without getting the chance to share it with the world. But suddenly, the astronomer notices that the room has gone quiet, the advisor is no longer yelling, and the torturer has stopped operating the machine. The astronomer opens his eyes to see the advisor and the torturer both in a deep bow. His gaze continues up and he sees the king himself standing in front of him. The king stares at the astronomer for what feels like an eternity before simply asking, is it true? The astronomer, limbs still stretched on the rack, manages a nod, and with his remaining strength whispers, It's true. The king motions with his hand to the torturer, who stands up and begins releasing the astronomer from his constraints. The advisor protests, But my lord, this man… But he's cut off by the king with a stern look, and retreats back into his deep bow. Show me, the king says, as the astronomer stands rubbing his sore shoulders where the tendons and muscles were stretched far beyond their natural limits. The astronomer opens the door to his laboratory and gestures for the king to enter. The room is a mess of papers and scientific equipment, a reflection of the busy and scattered mind of the man who works here. The king is immediately drawn to a table with a large scroll. He spreads it across the table and examines it, but his face betrays no hint of what he is thinking. Is this what you showed my advisors? The astronomer nods yes. Would you like to see for yourself? The astronomer motions to the window, where a brass tube is attached to a tripod. The king approaches the device, but doesn't know how it works. The astronomer demonstrates by looking through the eyepiece. He moves it slightly, making small adjustments to make sure it is just right for the king. There, now look. The king bends over to peer through the telescope, and a look of shock comes over his face. What he sees is the most incredible thing he has ever witnessed. There, far above up in the sky, unable to be seen by the naked eye, is a man, and he is staring back at him. The planet that this played out on was not Earth, but a bizarre place that is one of the strangest anomalies in the entire SCP Foundation archive. This is SCP-007, also known as Abdominal Planet. SCP-007 is a spherical object located in the abdomen of a young man or rather, in the space where his abdomen should be, since most of the muscle, skin, and organs that should be present 
simply are not. The subject, a Caucasian male in his mid-twenties of average height and build, does not appear affected by the large missing portion of his body, and has not reported experiencing pain or discomfort of any kind. In the space where his abdominal muscles and organs should be is a small globe composed of soil and water. This sphere, which measures roughly 60 centimeters in diameter, resembles the planet Earth, though the arrangement of the continents does not match any known configuration from our own planet's history. The tiny planet has its own weather patterns and even a small but still detectable gravitational pull. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of SCP-007 is that it appears to be inhabited. Microscopic organisms that would correspond to roughly the scale of human beings on Earth have been observed on the surface of the planet. So far, two distinct intelligent species have been identified, both of whom seem to possess a technological level similar to the 15th century on Earth. It is unknown if the inhabitants of the abdominal planet are aware of the world outside of their planet, and communication attempts with the planet's occupants have been placed on hold by senior Foundation officials, pending further study into what effect an exchange may have on them or us. The human subject within which SCP-007 is located provided the Foundation with a name that he claims to be his, but no records of such a person existing have yet to be located. Upon being questioned about the lack of records, he willfully offered both a social security and driver's license number, but when they were checked against current records, neither had yet to be assigned by the US government. And the mysteries surrounding this man don't stop there. The subject has not shown the need for either food or water, and it is unknown what energy source his body continues to operate on without nutrition. He is capable of both eating and drinking though, despite the large missing section of his stomach, but it is still not known what happens to the substances after he swallows them. The man has above average intelligence and scored a 128 on an administered IQ test. He also generally appears friendly and amiable and expresses only a passing curiosity about the planet located within his abdomen and how it came to be there. When asked about the origins of the planet, he replied very matter-of-factly that, I just woke up one day and there it was. I don't have any idea how it got there. Due to the poorly understood nature of SCP-007, it has been classified as Euclid, and the small planet and the man it resides in are contained in a sealed, comfortably furnished 10 by 10 meter room that the subject is not allowed to leave. The subject is to be monitored closely by Foundation staff and has a weekly chess game with one of the attending doctors, which also serves as an opportunity to evaluate his mental health. So far, he has not shown any signs of mental illness or violent tendencies and seems to be quite content. In general, he appears happy with his restricted living situation inside the Foundation facility and has made no attempts to escape. The subject has made multiple requests for access to a computer with an internet connection, but due to potential security risks, this request has thus far been denied. A man is lying in a hospital bed, and it is clear that he is not doing well. A group of doctors buzz around him performing various tests, checking his vital signs again and again. The man feels weak and a little disoriented, and the looks on the various doctors' faces tells him all he needs to know. Something is very wrong with him. Finally, there is a break in the commotion, and the doctors stop prodding at him and peering into his eyes with a bright, blinding light. All of the doctors and nurses leave the room except for one. The doctor steps towards the man and tells him that he has some bad news. You see, before the doctor can finish, someone else emerges from the shadows in the corner of the room and taps him on the shoulder. I'll handle this. The man hadn't noticed this person, but he can see now that he's dressed in a suit and unlike the doctors, he doesn't have any identifying items like a name tag or badge. Maybe he's some kind of professor or a renowned surgeon who is going to tell him how they will make him better. The doctor steps back from the bed but the man in the suit tells the doctor that it would be best if he and the patient could be left alone. Just for a moment, of course. The doctor nods in agreement and leaves the room. The man in the suit waits until the door is closed behind him to continue. He tells the sick man that he has a rare condition, quite rare. So rare, in fact, that you're the only person to ever have it, the only recorded case in history. The man in the suit sits down on the bed next to the man and takes his hand, lifting it up, examining it. The man's hand is an odd color. It has a slight green tint to it, and the skin itself appears to be taking on a fibrous quality. The sick man feels very tired, but he manages to whisper, Are you a doctor? Are you going to help me? The man in the suit responds, Yes, I'm a doctor. Of sorts. A doctor and a researcher. 
I work for a very important organization, and I specialize in cases just like yours. Well, not exactly like yours. You're unique. Quite special, in fact. The sick man <laughs> offers a weak smile. I'm very lucky. Oh yes, very lucky indeed. Well, not because of your condition, of course, but because I am here. You see, if it's all right with you, we'd like for you to come with us, to come stay at one of our facilities for a while. We can't promise that we'll be able to figure out exactly what's happening or why. But if we can, we have a much better chance of figuring out how to cure it. To cure you, so you can go back to a normal life. Do I have much of a choice? The sick man asks. Of course you do. It's completely up to you. I think this would be your best course of action, your best by far, in fact. But we can't force you to do anything you don't want to do. The sick man looks down at his greenish hand again, turning it over in front of his face, examining the small growths that seem to be sprouting from his skin. When do we leave? Right now, the man in the suit tells him. The nurses will come get you ready, and then we'll be on our way. The man in the suit leaves the room and closes the door behind him. Standing next to the door in the hallway are a pair of men wearing tactical uniforms like a SWAT team. The man in the suit tells them that luckily they won't be needed today. This one is coming easy. The sick man lies on a bed, but now he is in a new room. This one is even more sterile than the hospital, with cold concrete walls and harsh fluorescent lights. Just like in the hospital, he's surrounded by a seemingly never-ending cast of doctors, nurses, and researchers. They too poke and prod at him, take samples, and administer all kinds of tests. As time goes on, the man's condition only grows worse. It seems there's nothing that they can do to stop his condition from advancing. The green color spreads across his body and his skin soon becomes woody and stiff. If he sits in one place for too long without moving, tiny fibers emerge from his skin like probing roots looking for soil. All the while, the man grows weaker and more fragile. Even the slightest movement seems to cause him great pain. The doctor who originally brought the man to the facility gathers with a small group in the observation room next to the man's containment cell. They discuss the results of a recent test which showed that much of the melanin in his skin has somehow been replaced with chlorophyll, and that the fibrous quality of his skin is being caused by the appearance of cellulose around his cells. In other words, he isn't just starting to look like a plant, he's truly becoming a plant, and there doesn't seem to be anything they can do to stop it. Try as they might, they haven't found a single clue as to what is causing the man's condition, or how to treat it. The man, though, seems strangely at peace with his fate. He's told that they're going to allow him to live, whether that be as a man or as a plant in containment, for as long as he can stay alive, and that he will be well taken care of to make the whole process as comfortable for him as possible. Even though they failed to find a cure for his anomalous disease, they will do everything in their power to make sure he doesn't suffer. A tragic yet familiar tale for the SCP Foundation, a normal person is subjected to an abnormal situation that completely changes their life, and not for the better. At least in this situation, the Foundation appears to have shown a rare glimpse of their own humanity opting to make this safe class anomaly's existence as painless as possible rather than force it to endure a lifetime of painful tests and studies. Or at least that's what you've been led to believe. Unfortunately, everything you've just seen about SCP-1500 is a lie. Those with level 3 clearance, though, can learn the truth, which is that SCP-1500 is actually an extremely dangerous anomaly, whose true identity must be hidden from even the majority of the Foundation, for reasons you'll soon learn. SCP-1500 is not a man suffering from a condition that causes him to slowly transform into a plant-like being, but is actually a greenish-gray, smooth-skinned humanoid with no facial features at all. Its limbs are long and multi-jointed, and its abdomen is highly distended. The skin is exceptionally durable and tough, and though SCP-1500 has no visible sense organs like ears or a nose, it still appears to possess senses that are roughly equivalent to an average human's. The entity is incapable of speech, owing to its lack of a mouth, and it has not shown a need to eat, breathe, or sleep at all. In addition to the strange appearance of SCP-1500, its primary anomalous effect is the impact it has on any human that comes within its line of sight, or rather what would be its line of sight if it had any eyes. Those that do find that they will soon begin experiencing headaches, nausea, and an overwhelming sense of dread. These symptoms will increase over the next several minutes, with the headaches becoming more and more debilitating, and the feelings of nausea and fear growing until eventually the subject passes out. They will remain unconscious for roughly 15 seconds, after which they will awaken and claim to have no memory of ever being exposed to SCP-1500. But something else strange also happens to the subject after waking. 
When asked to describe the creature known as SCP-1500, they will no longer remark on its faceless head or long twisted limbs. Instead, they will describe the creature as being an average looking Caucasian male. Even stranger is that to them, it now has a name, Zachary Callahan. In further interviews with subjects exposed to SCP-1500, it became clear that many of their memories had been reshaped to now include the entity in its human-looking Zachary Callahan form. They would often describe him as a close friend from childhood or early adulthood, and one that played a significant role in their lives. They also claim that they are perfectly capable of communicating with Zachary Callahan, able to carry on conversations with him, while all the observing researchers will see is an apparently one-sided conversation between the subject and the featureless gray-skinned creature. While Foundation personnel have found that they are able to remove the false memories from the subject's minds through the use of amnestics, they have yet to be able to reverse the effect that causes the subject to see SCP-1500 as a human being, and everyone who has been exposed continues to see the entity as Zachary Callahan forevermore. It is still unknown what kind of long-term effects this exposure may have or how dangerous to their mental or physical health it will turn out to be. Even more concerning, is that evidence has emerged that SCP-1500 may be able to affect more than just those in its immediate presence. Recently, a United States Senator was giving a televised speech on a rather uninteresting topic. The speech started out normal enough, but then the Senator began to relay an anecdote about a childhood fishing trip he had taken with a friend. You won't be surprised to learn that according to the Senator, the friend's name was none other than Zachary Callahan. Investigations into the senator's background concluded that there was no person by that name of the appropriate age in the area where he grew up. It was also discovered the senator had suffered an especially bad migraine at a dinner party the week before the speech. Further research into SCP-1500's memory-altering effects have also revealed that they might just be more intrusive than first believed. Rather than simply appearing as an old friend, subjects exposed to 1500 have begun to report that Zachary Callahan actually played a much more prominent role in their lives, either as a close relative, a parental figure, or even a former lover. In each of these cases, the subjects described their feelings for Zachary Callahan as ones of adoration, and that he made them feel protected and loved. Most troubling of all is a recent addendum to the SCP-1500 file, which describes the very latest research on the anomaly and its effects. It is now estimated that as many as 23,000 people all across the world have been affected by the creature, with the idea of Zachary Callahan implanted into their memories. It is unknown why it is trying to spread its influence so far and wide, but one clue that may point to a nefarious purpose is that it seems to be disproportionately targeting political and military figures, as well as SCP Foundation personnel. Following these new developments, classification of SCP-1500 to Keter was requested and granted. Due to the risk that SCP-1500 poses through its anomalous effects, and its powerful ability to influence those in positions of great power, it is permanently kept in a modified humanoid containment cell at Site-17. No personnel are allowed to enter into its containment chamber under any circumstances, nor are there security cameras in its cell. A false containment document describing a human male with an anomalous plant-like effect was placed in the database in order to deter further investigation into the real SCP-1500. And any personnel who experience painful, persistent headaches are immediately transferred away from Site-17, while any who attempt to breach containment are immediately terminated. Is SCP-1500 planting the seeds for something big by infiltrating the minds of some of the most influential people on Earth? Or is it merely looking for a connection, as it takes on a form that it wishes it could have in the only way it can, inside an imagination? Perhaps one day, we will know the answer. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1500, the story of me and my best friend Zach, and the time we rode motorcycles across Southeast Asia. Wait a, uh, wait a second. I didn't do that with Zach. Uh, <clears throat> Like SCP-163, the old castaway, for another truly bizarre guest of the SCP Foundation, whose story you definitely won't forget. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. The 13-year-old boy gets a running start before leaping across from one moss-covered boulder to another. He barely makes the jump and turns around to admire how far he leaped. He continues along through the woods, hopping over streams and making sure to swing on any hanging vines he can find, whether he needs to or not. He picks up a branch and starts to swing it against a tree, 
engaging in a life-and-death duel with the evil knight of the woods. After slaying the knight, the boy solemnly salutes his fallen foe before mounting his trusty steed to ride deeper into the forest. He's all alone out here and must be thousands of miles from civilization. The valiant knight unmounts from his horse and walks towards the culmination of his quest, the Tree of Lost Memories. Legend tells that anything buried beneath this tree will cease to exist. All memories of anything associated with the object buried will disappear from the minds of anyone involved, and no one will ever bring them up again or wonder where the memories went. The knight takes a letter sealed with wax from where he was keeping it safely inside of his armor and kneels in front of the tree. He brushes the leaves and dirt away from a spot near the base of the tree and digs a small hole with his hands before placing the letter inside the hole. The boy looks down at the letter, satisfied with his work. He starts covering the letter inside the hole with dirt when he suddenly stands up. Was that a noise? He listens again. It's not just a noise, it's a voice. The knight unsheathes his sword and starts making his way in the direction he can hear the sounds coming from. He follows a game trail through the woods towards the noise. There's no doubt, it's definitely a voice, and he can make it out clearly now. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. The knight rounds a corner, and the woods open up into a clearing. In the middle of the grassy open area is a stone archway unconnected to any walls. When looking through the archway, though, one doesn't simply see the other side of the clearing. No, inside the archway is a beautiful white alabaster castle perched on rock overlooking the sea, its red-roofed turrets jutting high up into the clouds. And standing next to the archway that seems to lead to another land is an old man dressed in a long flowing robe, a wizard's robe. The boy steps out of the woods into the clearing. What is this old man doing out here? And what's going on with this archway? It really does look like it is showing something it shouldn't be able to. Legends fade to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. Are you talking to me? The boy asks. Venture forth and face your true calling, the wizard responds. You are the one that has been prophesied, but have you what it takes to enter this land of adventure? The boy looks around. There's no one else here. This old man must be speaking to him, right? The boy tosses his stick to the ground and steps closer to the old man in the archway. He can see now that the surface of the archway appears to be shimmering, as if it were a vertical surface of water. Only the truest of hearts may enter the magical archway, but for the fair and brave, a great quest awaits. A quest? For me? The boy asks, but again, the old man doesn't respond. He doesn't seem to be looking at him either. Is this wise old man in the woods blind? The boy gets much closer now, close enough to wave his hand in front of the old man's face, but there's no reaction. He really must be blind. The boy looks back at the portal in the archway. He can see the waves breaking on the rocks and birds flying in the sky. He can even make out, up in one of the highest windows on the tallest tower, what looks to be a... a girl. She's waving her ribbon in the air. She's beckoning him. She needs the brave knight to come save her. Pursue your destiny and become the hero you were always meant to be. The boy is entranced by the beauty of this land, the castle, the clouds drifting between the white towers, the perfectly blue sea, and the beautiful princess locked in her tower, waiting for him. The boy reaches his hand through the surface of the archway, and it passes through as if nothing were there. But on the other side, it turns into the gauntleted hand of a knight. He pulls his hand back out, and it looks like his own hand once again. The boy thinks about his mother, yelling at him for drawing pictures of the lands he wished he could live in when he should be studying. He thinks of his teacher grabbing the fantasy book out of his hand and dropping it in the trash, calling it a waste of time. He thinks of his friends laughing when he came to school dressed as a knight. He knew he was destined for something greater. And here it finally is. He really is a knight. He's the hero that was prophesied. He will become a legend. He's special. The knight girds himself and steps forward into the archway. As he does, he hears the old man still talking. The wheel of history turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that... The boy passes through the archway, and the castle, the sea, the princess, all of them disappear in an instant. The boy spins around, but the archway constricts, 
snapping shut in a tight ball with him still inside. The old man sinks to the ground as the archway seems to rotate. The archway then also disappears into the earth as something else emerges. A giant centipede appears out of the ground, its scaly body the color of stone with movable plates on its posterior end that resembles the movement of cloth. The centipede opens its mouth, and there's a sound like the cry of a child before it dives down and disappears under the dirt. Have you ever thought that you were destined for something more? Do you feel as if the worlds described in fantasy books and that are brought to life in movies and in video games are somehow the places you actually belong? You're far from alone, but be careful, because it's exactly those thoughts that make you the prime target for SCP-4310, a deadly predator that preys on those with the desire to embark on a hero's journey. SCP-4310 is an anomalous creature that resembles a common centipede in many ways, though it has a number of traits that distinguish it from the kind you might find under a rock in the forest. Perhaps most obvious is its size. While some centipedes can grow as long as a foot, SCP-4310 is over 20 feet in length. This massive carnivorous centipede, which is native to Great Britain and Ireland, also has a hunting method that is quite distinct from any arthropod, insect, or known animal at all for that matter. SCP-4310 hunts by cocooning itself in a pair of keratin flaps that cover its entire body except for its tail end, which is left exposed. The centipede then buries itself in the ground, keeping its head and the majority of its body under the ground, except for a portion that arcs above the ground in a semicircle shape as well as its exposed posterior. The centipede's end resembles an old man wearing robes, and the centipede is able to manipulate its rear legs in a way that resembles the movement of a mouth and jaw giving the impression that the old man is speaking. The rest of its body is contorted, and the legs are arranged in such a way to resemble a stone archway standing unsupported on the ground next to the old man. Through a process that is yet to be understood by the Foundation, the centipede is able to produce a spatial anomaly in the area where its body is taking on the form of an archway. This spatial anomaly is actually a portal of sorts, a portal that leads directly into SCP-4310's stomach. As soon as its prey enters the spatial anomaly, the centipede closes the portal. Inside, paralysis-inducing enzymes incapacitate the prey as powerful stomach acids break down its meal over the course of several days. You may be thinking, I would never walk into an archway next to an old man in the middle of the forest, but SCP-4310 has two powerful mechanisms perfectly suited to luring its prey. First, it is capable of emitting a pheromone that induces a state of mild euphoria, while at the same time, suppressing fear and encouraging curiosity. This appears to affect all warm-blooded mammals, but humans and their natural inclination towards exploration makes them especially vulnerable to the effects. The second method 4310 utilizes to acquire food is producing a very unique set of sounds. These sounds, which are made by rubbing together portions inside of its tail segment, resemble English speech and are almost always phrases that describe quests, prophecies, and heroic deeds that can only be undertaken by journeying into the archway. SCP-4310 calls can last for as long as three minutes before they begin to repeat the series of heroic phrases, and each instance of SCP-4310 appears to have its own unique set of calls to embark on adventure, but with all encouraging entrance into the archway. It is unknown just how SCP-4310 learns these phrases, since, other than this advanced hunting technique, no instance of the anomalous creature has shown intelligence levels above that of an ordinary centipede. Interestingly, the same heroic speech sounds appear to also act as SCP-4310's mating call, and it is unknown if the luring of would-be adventurers by the noises is merely a lucky byproduct or if it specifically uses the sounds for both mating and eating. SCP-4310 became known to the SCP Foundation in the 1950s following an investigation into multiple missing persons in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Agents searched a nearby forest and soon discovered human teeth in animal droppings concentrated around a wooded grotto. The grotto was excavated, and three instances of SCP-4310 were found hibernating beneath the ground. It's since been learned that after eating their fill, SCP-4310 will enter a hibernation state that can last as long as 10 years, and it appeared that these three instances ate well, since the remains of over 70 children were eventually found in the immediate area. SCP-4310 has been classified as Euclid, and currently, one instance is kept in a containment cell for observation and testing. 
The cell has been filled with a thick layer of soil resembling that found in the temperate forests of Great Britain, and once per week, five piglets are introduced into the centipede's enclosure. Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, codenamed Pest Control, is dispatched to areas where there are reports of old men resembling wizards encouraging people to step through a magical archway, and the MTF agents are to exterminate any instances that they find in the wild. The Foundation's Department of Analytics also monitors all contemporary British children's and young adult literature, especially the fantasy genre, for references to portals in the woods that lead to wondrous locations, and Lambda-12 is alerted to any that may be inspired by, or referencing, real SCP-4310 instances. All of us fantasize from time to time about embarking on an epic quest that will allow us to escape our regular lives. While it is fun to dream about being swept off to another world, be very careful if you meet an old man in the woods who tells you that your quest begins with stepping through a magical archway, or you might just find that your hero's journey starts and ends in the belly of a giant centipede. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3456, The Orcadian Horseman, for another anomaly that blurs the lines between myth and reality. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. Ouch! The boy on the bus turns around. Did someone pull out one of his hairs? He looks around, but the girl in the seat behind him is staring out the window. She's so quiet and always keeps to herself, he doesn't think it possibly could have been her. The boy turns back around, wondering if he just imagined it, unable to see the small smile forming on the girl's face. The bus stops, and the girl practically sprints off and up the sidewalk to her house. She runs past her mother without saying hello and goes straight into her bedroom, closing and locking the door behind her. She sits at her desk, opens a drawer, and pulls out a small bag. She reaches into the bag and takes out a folded piece of paper. Congratulations on your purchase of a genuine naughty stalker. Do you love someone but they won't give you the time of day? Do you wish you could hear what they say about you behind their back? Well, wonder no more. Using this fantabulous product, you can keep track of your loved one's every move, their every word. The girl imagines herself watching a tiny version of the boy on the bus right here on her desk, seeing everything that he does, listening to his secret thoughts and desires. If only she knew him better, then she'd have the confidence to talk to him and could get him to like her as much as she liked him. She reaches into the bag and pulls out the naughty stalker. It doesn't look like much, just a little doll made from a woven and twisted length of red string. She looks back to the instructions. All you have to do is get a single hair from the head of the object of your desires, slip it under a loose string in our naughty stalker, and see what you've been missing. The girl reaches into her pocket and takes out a single strand of hair. She holds the hair up to the light, looking at it. If this works, it will mean all of her dreams coming true. Just like the instructions said to do, she takes the hair and slides it under a string on the doll's body. She sets the doll down on her desk and waits. And waits. And... nothing happens. She picks up the instructions again, turning them over. But there's nothing else except... Another wonderful product brought to you by blah blah blah. Where were the rest of the instructions on how to get it to work? Why wasn't the doll coming to life? What a piece of junk. What a… wait, what was that? The girl leans in close. Is the doll… breathing? She's startled as the doll turns its head over its shoulder, seemingly looking right at her, or rather, right through her. Coming, mom, the doll shouts before standing up. It starts to walk in place, looking like it is opening invisible doors and then sitting down on a chair that she can't see. It looks like it's pretending to eat dinner. The girl's eyes widen. The doll is alive. It's really alive. It's actually showing what the boy is doing right now. The naughty stalker has worked. The girl is fascinated by watching the little doll that gives her a peek into her crush's life. She skips her own dinner so she can watch him finish his. She watches as he sits, probably watching TV, takes a shower, and gets ready for bed. It may all just be a little doll acting it out, but it feels like she is there with him. She watches the doll sleep for hours before falling finally asleep herself, her head resting on the desk next to him. The next morning, she passes by the boy and his friend sitting together on the bus and goes to the very back. She gets as low in the seat as she can so no one can see her and takes out the doll, holding it up to her ear. 
She listens to one side of the conversation as the boy talks about the action movie he watched last night, Weapon of Mass Extinction. The boy talks about how much he liked it and how it's his new favorite movie. This was perfect. It's exactly what she needed. The next day in school, as the boy is putting things into his locker, the girl approaches. She pretends to trip and drops her books in front of him, the books scattering on the floor in front of him. The boy helps her pick them up and notices the DVD she dropped, Weapons of Mass Extinction. She explains that she brought her favorite movie to school to loan it to a friend. What a coincidence that they both happen to love the same film. The boy and the girl, bonding over their love of low-budget sci-fi action films, start spending more and more time together. No one has ever understood him the way that she does. It's as if she has known him for years, even though they've only been friends for a few days. Things move quickly though, and before long, he realizes that he is having romantic feelings for the girl. This is all the girl had ever wanted, and it's all thanks to the naughty stalker. Things are going so well, in fact, that she imagines she won't even need it much longer. But then, something strange happens. She is sure she heard the boy tell his friend that he loved baseball, but when she brings up the idea of going to a game together, the boy looks at her like she was crazy. He hated baseball. After that, things seem to change. The boy is still so nice when they are together. Now it sounds like he is talking about her behind her back. She worries that she has been wrong this whole time, that he has just been messing with her. This stupid doll isn't making her dreams come true, it's making her life a nightmare. But wait, who is the boy talking to? She leans in close to listen. Is he… with another girl? Listening to one side of the conversation, she hears the boy tell someone that this is all just a big joke, a prank he is pulling on some dumb girl. Are they… no, they can't be. Kissing? The girl is in a white-hot rage. She can't believe he would do this to her, after she was nothing but perfect to him. She throws the doll across her room. She's going to confront the boy and whoever he's with. She'll teach him a lesson. She'll teach both of them a lesson. It's starting to rain as the girl gets her bike out and starts to ride to where she knows he is, the spot that was supposed to be their own special place. Cars pass close by on the narrow road, splashing her with water, but she doesn't care. She finally reaches the picnic spot where he took her just a few days ago, and she sees a car parked nearby. It must belong to the evil seductress he is with. The girl glares at the car. She grits her teeth until they feel like they might crack. Her fists are clenched so tight that she can't tell if it's the rain or blood from her fingernails digging in that she feels running down her palms. But she doesn't care. She's going to show both of them what happens when you break someone's heart. She takes a step towards the car and… The car that struck her slams on its brakes. The driver gets out and rushes towards her. It's the boy. Her boy. The older couple who were stopped on the side of the road with a flat tire run over to help. The boy gets down next to her and cradles her head in his lap, and they have one last moment to look into each other's eyes before the light fades from hers. Unfortunately for all involved, their lives would never be the same. But how could they have known that they were the victims of an encounter with an anomaly that, while small, is extremely dangerous? One that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-693. The Naughty Stalker SCP-693 are multiple humanoid-shaped dolls, measuring roughly 18 centimeters in length, each made from a single string that is either red, blue, yellow, or black, with onyx beads for eyes. Their clothing will vary in color and style, and seems to have no bearing on the properties of the doll. The string doll will behave exactly as one would expect, showing no anomalous properties at all until the owner takes the steps that are spelled out in the instructions that always accompany SCP-693. The instruction sheet congratulates the owner on their acquisition of a naughty stalker and explains that in order to use it, a single hair from another person must be inserted into a loop of its string, at which point the doll will attune to that person. The doll will then come alive, mimicking the actions of the hair's owner in real time, including their speech. The doll will perfectly portray the attuned individual for nine days, after which point it will become unreliable. The exact way in which SCP-693 begins changing the speech and actions depends on the color of its base string, but in all cases, its end goal is to drive the current owner of the doll to their death. SCP-693 goes about this by feeding inaccurate information to the owner. Dolls made of red string try to send their owner into increasingly violent fits of rage. Dolls comprised of blue string try to depress the owner and lead them to self-harm. 
Yellow dolls want to make their owners attempt unwanted acts of physical love, and black dolls encourage their owners to engage in activities and place themselves in situations that are dangerous. Interestingly, SCP-693 will attune not just to the living, but to the deceased as well. When a dead person's hair is placed in a loop of string, the naughty stalker will come to life, just as it does when a living person's is used. But instead of acting out the speech and movements of the person, the attuned doll will claim to be the deceased person and offer to act as a spiritual guide to the owner. But just like with a living person, at the nine-day mark, SCP-693 will become unreliable and will attempt to lead the owner down a path that results in their death. Once an SCP-693 instance is successful in causing its owner's death, a new doll instance will appear and be found on the owner's body. Several of these dolls have been recovered from Naughty Stalker victims, and currently, the Foundation has seven red instances, ten blue instances, five yellow instances, and one black instance in its possession. All instances of SCP-693 contained by the Foundation were originally classified as safe and kept in Containment Locker 12C-K, but following the events of Incident 693E, that classification was revisited. During this incident, a researcher returned a Naughty Stalker doll to its containment locker, but in a lapse of judgment that went against Foundation protocols, they forgot to remove the hair that had been placed in the doll. When the locker was next opened, the dolls were observed to have all been moved. They were found in a circle around the accidentally still-attuned doll, which had been crucified upside down on the wall of the locker. It is unknown where the dolls acquired nails. After this incident, a camera was placed inside of the locker, and the results were… surprising, to say the least. It turns out that SCP-693 instances come to life when they are not observed, even when they aren't attuned. While they have not yet been observed engaging in violent acts against each other, the camera has captured the naughty stalkers appearing to reenact the final 30 minutes of their last owner's life over and over. Following this new information, all instances of Naughty Stalker dolls were moved to their own separate 25 by 25 by 25 centimeter steel containers within the containment locker, and their classification was upgraded to Euclid. SCP-693 is one of the rare anomalies where the Foundation actually has quite a good idea as to where it originates, and it was very easy to discover as well. Provided that they aren't a deception, the instructions that appear with each instance of SCP-693 are quite explicit about where they come from. After congratulating the owner on their acquisition and explaining how the doll works, the instructions close by extolling the naughty stalker as yet another wonderful product brought to you by The Factory. For those unaware, The Factory is a place with a long connection to the Foundation, though the details on that will have to wait for another file exploration. All you need to know now is that The Factory produces a huge amount of anomalies, and it appears that SCP-693 is one of them. There are theories that the dolls may have been produced as an espionage tool, but as for why their primary purpose seems to be driving their owner to their death, well that, we simply don't know. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. Who are you talking to? The young boy spins around, surprised to find his father standing behind him. The boy seems nervous and hesitant to answer, but after being asked again, he admits to his father that he was talking to the lady in the fountain. The boy's father is confused. The lady in the fountain? That's right. The boy explains that she is nice, just like mom. He thinks the woman in the fountain may even be his mom. The father sighs. He takes the boy's hand and leads him back inside the house, where the father is hosting a small get-together. One of the father's guests asks if things are okay and he tells her that everything is fine. He's just worried about his son. It has been a very difficult year following the death of his wife. He tells her that he's afraid he might be developing behavioral issues as he watches the boy staring out the window at the fountain in their backyard. Later that week in school, the children are supposed to be drawing pictures of their families. The teacher moves from child to child, checking on their progress, and stops at the boy. She wants to know what he's working on. The boy explains that it is a drawing of him, his dad, and his mom who lives in the fountain. The teacher doesn't understand. His mom lives in the fountain? That's right, the boy tells her. The fountain in their backyard was her favorite place in the whole world. His mother had told him that it was a magical place and was the reason they bought the house. After she died, he heard a voice coming from the fountain. It doesn't sound like his mom, but he knows it's her. She lives in the fountain now. 
The father thanks the teacher for calling and promises that he'll talk to his son. He's very sorry that the other children are frightened by the stories about a woman in their fountain, and he's going to make sure this whole business comes to an end for good. That night, as he is putting the boy to bed, he tells him that he knows he misses his mom, but he needs to stop with all of these claims about a woman in the fountain. And as much as he misses her and wishes that his mother would come back, he needs to realize that she's gone and not coming back. The father kisses the boy in the forehead and tells him one more time that there will be no more stories about the woman before tucking him in for the night. As soon as his father is gone though, the boy gets out of bed, creeps to his bedroom window that looks down on their backyard, and stares at the fountain. He watches as reflections dance on the rippling water. The water goes oddly still, until a hand that appears to be made out of water seems to emerge out of the surface of the fountain and waves at him. The father leaves the bathroom and glances in to check on his son before heading back to his bedroom. He bolts upright when it dawns on him that his son wasn't in bed. He runs into the son's room and pulls the blankets off the bed, but no one is there. He frantically calls for his son and looks around the room when he sees something. He hurries to the window where he watches as his son walks towards the fountain. But what really has his attention is the woman, translucent and shining under the moonlight, beckoning for the boy to approach her. The father rushes downstairs and out into the backyard, where his son is in an embrace with the watery woman. He is terrified, but his fatherly instincts take over and he sprints to the fountain and rips the boy away from the creature. As he pulls the boy back from the fountain, he watches as the solid, watery figure of the woman appears to turn back into a liquid and collapse into the fountain. The father brings the boy inside the house. He doesn't understand what's going on, but the father just keeps repeating that he's okay. He's safe now. The next day, the father is on the phone with their local priest. He knows how crazy this sounds, but the police didn't believe him, and he didn't know where else to turn. The priest tells him not to worry, that he will be there soon to take care of it. The priest arrives at the house with two assistants, and tells the father that it would be best if he and his son leave. The boy is crying, pleading with him not to hurt the nice woman in the fountain. The father has to struggle to restrain his son, but eventually is able to get him out of the house. Once they're gone, the priest turns to his assistants. He takes off his shirt to reveal a tactical vest underneath emblazoned with the SCP logo as his assistants do the same. Time for containment, he says, as they head out into the backyard towards the fountain and the anomalous creature that lives there. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph. SCP-054 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to an anomalous entity with some very strange properties. Made up of nine liters of what appears to be completely normal spring water, SCP-054 most often appears in the form of a female humanoid, but it is capable of a variety of forms, such as other humanoids and simple geometric shapes. It is unknown just how it is capable of taking and holding these shapes, or how it moves around once it does so since all tests performed so far have failed to show any thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or other phenomenon present in its body that could explain its abilities. Whenever SCP-054 enters a body of water, it will become indistinguishable from the surrounding water, and it appears that it must fully submerge itself on occasion in order to replenish its full volume, which is constantly being reduced through normal evaporation. Water that has evaporated off of the anomaly has also been collected by the Foundation, and it too is indiscernible from regular water and exhibits no special properties. After its discovery, SCP-054 was moved to Site-08 for containment, where additional research and study of the creature could take place. Its special containment cell was made watertight and equipped with a specialized climate control system, as well as an ornate fountain filled with fresh spring water. Surprisingly, the entity seemed to enjoy its new home, and appeared happy to interact with Foundation researchers, guards, and maintenance staff, frequently mimicking their forms often in a playful manner. While at first, 054 would retreat back into its fountain when it wasn't interacting with staff, as time went on, it seemed to grow more and more comfortable, and eventually came to spend almost all of its time outside of the water. Though it would still always return back to the safety of the fountain and disappear into the water when attempts were made to extract samples directly from its body. Though it avoided having its water drawn, it was through a variety of different tests by SCP researcher Dr. Seskel that much of the Foundation's knowledge of SCP-054 was gained. Though whether the methods researchers used to acquire this information were appropriate is up to you to decide. In a test dubbed the Water Loss Experiment, SCP-054 was denied access to water. 
As a result, its shape changed, with 054 becoming more compact, most likely in order to reduce its surface area as much as possible and reduce the rate of evaporation that occurred. For the first few days after access to water was removed, it would happily greet anyone who entered its containment cell, which may indicate that it was attempting to charm staff into providing water. When after a few days its water supply was still not turned on, it stopped acting especially cheery, perhaps realizing that its happy disposition was doing nothing to advance its cause. In an extreme temperature test, researchers were authorized to experiment with subjecting SCP-054 to temperatures below zero degrees Celsius. The entity became more and more lethargic as the temperature in the testing area was lowered, and eventually froze completely. Ice chips were collected for study, but analysis revealed no abnormalities or differences from standard water. The opposite test was also performed, and the temperature was raised to 95 degrees Celsius, just shy of the 100 degree boiling point of water. 054 became very aggressive as the temperature approached the upper threshold at which water can remain a liquid, and it attempted to escape the testing enclosure. Researchers noticed that following this test, the entity became increasingly resistant to being moved from its containment cell to the testing area, likely fearing that the researchers intended to do it harm. SCP-054's memory was tested as well, and it proved very skilled at solving puzzles and navigating mazes. Researchers initially had an issue with motivating 054 to participate, but Dr. Seskel discovered that the anomaly was quite responsive to the use of electrical shocks. The researchers would often push 054 too hard in these tests, though, and soon found that they would need to give it a 48-hour rest period between any strenuous experiments. The final test performed was meant to gain some insight into how SCP-054 maintains its form, by seeing how it reacted to a hydrochloric acid solution. It unsurprisingly resisted this test, and the temperature in the testing area was lowered to just above freezing in order to try and control its behavior. This did not prove to be enough, though. SCP-054 fought back against Dr. Seskel and his research assistant, seriously injuring both of them and necessitating a halt to the test. In fact, all testing on SCP-054 was stopped following this incident, as it appeared to develop an extreme mistrust of males, who made up the majority of the staff who had been performing the tests. Following this attack on the Foundation staff, SCP-054 was classified as Euclid. However, once the tests ceased and 054 no longer had to come in contact with the research staff who were in charge of the experiments, there was a span of over five years without any further incidents. Following this period, SCP-054's rating was downgraded to safe and now seems willing to begin participating in experiments once again, though now all tests fall under the purview of Biology Unit E7 and the use of only female personnel is recommended. Though classified as safe, caution must still be maintained when working with SCP-054. Maintenance personnel are required to wear chemical suits when working inside the containment area and must spend 10 minutes in a special drying room once they exit to ensure that 054 has not somehow managed to cling to any part of them. In the event of a containment breach, the entire enclosure is to be flushed with liquid nitrogen to freeze the entity. Is the water nymph an example of the SCP Foundation going too far, containing a harmless anomaly who appears happy and benign until harm is done to it? Or is this simply the price we must pay in order to further our knowledge of anomalies and potentially stop a dangerous threat to humanity? The answer to that question is up to you. To further your own knowledge of anomalies that the SCP Foundation has in containment and potentially find the answer to that question, I recommend you watch the files for SCP-007, Abdominal Planet, and SCP-163, An Old Castaway. And as always, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A firefighter is running through a burning apartment building. The air is thick with black smoke as burning debris crashes down around him. In the chaos, he's been split up from the rest of his crew. They've probably already exited the structure, and based on the conditions, he probably should too. But just as the firefighter turns to head back down the stairs, he hears something. There are cries coming from a room down the hall. The firefighter runs to the door. There's definitely someone inside. He can hear their voice as they cry for help. I'm coming, the firefighter yells. But when he tries to open the door, it won't budge. He backs up and throws his body against it again and again and again until finally the door bursts open. A wave of heat and smoke hits the firefighter, but he can see who is crying for help. There, across the room, hiding halfway under the bed, 
is a young girl. She's clutching a stuffed rabbit and crying with fear. The firefighter takes a step towards her, but he can feel the floor start to give way and has to step back. It will never support his weight. He'll need the girl to crawl to him. It's her only chance. He beckons for the girl to come to him as more flaming debris rains down. The little girl starts to crawl towards him, slowly at first, but then faster. She's almost to him when there's a loud crack. The fireman can only watch as the floor collapses beneath the little girl, and she falls. But suddenly, she stops. The fireman can't believe it. Her shirt has caught on a damaged pipe, and she hangs in the air as her stuffed rabbit is swallowed up in the flames below. The fireman reaches out for the little girl as she extends her hand towards his. They both stretch as far as they can, just a little further. They're almost touching, almost there. Just as their fingertips touch, the rest of the floor gives way, and they both fall. Outside, multiple crews man hoses and fight against the blaze, trying to contain the fire which is quickly getting out of control. There is a cry from one of the teams, and the men start running as a large portion of the building collapses. Was anyone still in there? Where's John? The fire chief asks anyone he can find but no one has seen him. Just then, in the entrance of the building, a figure appears, silhouetted against the flames. It's John. He steps out of the burning building. His suit looks like it has been completely melted by the flames. Somehow, he's alive, but he's alone. As the other firefighters rush to help him, he looks like he is in a daze. They ask him what happened, if there's anyone else inside who might still be able to make it out, but he can only stare at them. A few weeks later, John is sitting in the firehouse. His fellow firefighters can still hardly believe that he made it out of that inferno unscathed. But while the fire miraculously didn't touch his body, it seems to have made an impression in other ways. He's once again at a table with numerous papers spread in front of him. One of the other firemen from his crew starts teasing him about working on one of his projects yet again. What is it this time? Is he doing his monthly budget again, checking credit card statements for fraudulent charges? John is working on his retirement plan, actually. That fire may have shown him that life can be cut quite short, but it also taught him that it's important to get your life in order so that the time you do spend on this earth is well spent. The fireman is laughing at John's newfound fiscal responsibility when the bell starts to chime. No more jokes. It's time to suit up and get out. The firefighters arrive at another large structure fire. A man rushing out of the building tells them between coughs that there's still people inside. The firemen don't hesitate and head into the building. They search the second floor and see a door with smoke billowing out from underneath it. John checks the door for heat and gives a thumbs up. They open the door and head inside. The smoke is so thick that neither of them can see much of anything. But then, through the smoke, they spot something. A woman is lying on the floor. They both step towards her when a beam comes crashing down from the ceiling. They both leap out of the way and the fireman barely escapes being crushed. He stands up and asks if John is okay, but no response. He quickly looks around, but he can't see him. It's as if he just vanished. But there's no time to figure out what happened. He scoops up the woman, who coughs as he picks her up. She's still alive. As the fireman exits the building with the woman, she appears to have completely regained consciousness. The chief approaches them, but the fireman can only shake his head as if to say, John didn't make it this time. The woman who was rescued from the fire is in the hospital. The doctors can hardly believe it, but she tells them she's fine, and x-rays of her lungs show that there's nothing wrong at all. It's as if she hadn't just been carried out of a building where multiple civilians and firefighters were killed. The doctor tells her that they'll need to run a couple more tests, but if those come back clear, then he doesn't see any reason to hold her. As he is leaving her room, though, he stops and turns to her with one last thing. She has some visitors. The woman seems confused. As the doctor exits the room, a group of several people in dark black suits walk in. They look like FBI or CIA agents, but they don't have any badges. Good afternoon, ma'am. We're from the SCP Foundation. We've been looking for you. As the Foundation agents took this young woman into custody, researchers were already preparing a containment cell for her. Though once she got there, she would have a new name, SCP-069. This anomaly is a humanoid entity though its exact appearance can vary dramatically thanks to its bizarre ability. Whenever SCP-069 is left alone with a recently deceased person's body, 069 will acquire its exact appearance. And not only will SCP-069 look like the recently expired individual, it will also take on their physical mannerisms, their voice, and even their patterns of speech, 
allowing it to look and sound exactly like the person who just passed away. In the same moment that it begins mirroring the person, the corpse will also disappear by a process that Foundation researchers have yet to understand. The body vanishes without a trace, leaving only the new SCP-069 instance alive and well in its place. This doppelganger will be virtually indistinguishable from the original, with even DNA and fingerprint tests coming back as a match for the original. Friends and family will have no idea that an anomalous entity has taken their place, since in addition to taking on all of the physical qualities of the deceased person, SCP-069 will also gain their knowledge and memories. They will act exactly as the person did, with only one single difference setting them apart. Those who are around SCP-069 in the days and weeks after its transformation will notice that the person will suddenly start expressing a strong desire to get their life in order, with that vague phrase relating to any number of potential tasks. These can include resolving outstanding obligations in their life, either personal like paying back an owed favor, or financial such as resolving debts or making long-term life plans like opening retirement accounts and updating their last will and testament. They will also often make efforts to visit with extended or estranged family members, rekindle friendships that have been allowed to languish, or other acts of closure, the kind that can build up over a lifetime and are often put off until it is too late. SCP-069 seems to retain no knowledge of its previous impersonations, and it will not carry any memories or abilities from one instance to another, outside of the one recurring desire to make things right in its new form's life. When an identified SCP-069 entity has been asked why it is engaging in this new behavior, it claims to have no ulterior motives besides an overwhelming desire to get their life straightened out since, after all, you never know when an unforeseen injury or death might occur. 069 itself experiences pain, injuries, and death just as a normal human does, but those similarities end at the exact moment they expire. When SCP-069 dies, its body will rapidly decay, turning to dust almost instantly. The Foundation has tried to preserve its body or at least stave off the rapid decomposition, but so far, all attempts have failed. After it has died, SCP-069 will then re-manifest at the site of the most recent human death, regardless of its proximity to where 069 died. There does not appear to be any distance limitation to this ability, and the largest such jump the Foundation has recorded is to a death that was 675 kilometers away from where its previous form died. This anomaly first came into the SCP Foundation's radar after field agents learned of a firefighter who appeared to miraculously survive an extremely deadly building fire, which claimed the lives of two other firefighters and 11 civilians. The firefighter had walked out of the building unscathed despite his suit and equipment suffering an amount of damage that their wearer should not have been able to survive. Roughly three weeks later, the same firefighter responded to another large building fire. He was lost inside a smoky room, and was presumed to have died, despite his body never being recovered. A single civilian was rescued, and much like the firefighter, appeared unharmed, a virtual impossibility given the extremely smoky conditions from which she was saved. An SCP containment team, Mobile Task Force SHE-3, also known as the Body Snatchers, were sent to the hospital where she was recovering the next day, and SCP-069 was identified and taken into Foundation custody for the first time. Containment of this particular anomaly would prove to be quite tricky though, especially when its abilities were not fully understood. Several years after its initial capture, a guard assigned to SCP-069's cell was killed during a containment breach by another SCP, and the proximity of the guard's corpse to SCP-069 allowed them to take on their form. Though it was quickly discovered that the jump had taken place, and SCP-069 was returned to containment, they remained insistent that the Foundation was making a mistake and imprisoning one of their own. Over time, though, their protestations waned, and eventually, SCP-069 became relatively compliant and cooperative with staff. That is, until a huge mistake was made that would necessitate a drastic change to its containment procedures. A junior researcher who was assigned to 069 accidentally let slip that the agent's family had been informed of their untimely death. This seemed to greatly distress 069, and they reacted to the news by attempting to commit suicide. It's unknown what exactly triggered this response, since just being told that they were an imposter did not appear to have this effect in the past. But something about the family learning of the original person's death seems to have a profound impact on SCP-069. Following this event, SCP-069 has been placed on suicide watch, and plans to use other recently deceased SCP Foundation employees as possible targets for its ability have been suspended. 
SCP-069 continues to live in the form of its former guard, and is housed at Humanoid Containment Site 06-3. It continues to insist that it actually is the deceased agent, and still expresses a desire to get its life in order. Despite looking, sounding, and acting exactly as the former Foundation agent, it is not to be treated as if it is that person, no matter how tempting it may be for former friends and co-workers of the departed to have one last visit. If SCP-069 ever attempts to or is successful in breaching containment, it is to be subdued using non-lethal methods. Should SCP-069 die while in containment, Foundation agents are to closely monitor any reports of incidents where it appears that someone has somehow escaped certain death, a telltale sign that the person is now actually SCP-069. In the meantime, the Foundation will continue to study this strange anomaly, which has been classified as safe, and though we may never fully understand its abilities, perhaps there's something we can learn from it when it comes to second chances. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3998, The Wicker Witch Lives, for another strange tale of an SCP that may not be exactly what it seems. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A worker presses down on the plunger, and moments later, a huge explosion rocks the quarry. When the dust clears, the three quarry workers look on at the pile of rocks that they'll now spend the next days and weeks hauling out. But then, they spot something strange. There in the newly exposed rock face is an opening. The three men stand at the mouth of the previously hidden cave. They poke their heads inside, but it's too dark to see much of anything, except for the fact that the tunnel in the rock stretches on for at least a few meters before it turns and prevents them from seeing any further. One of the quarry workers slaps his co-worker on the back and dares him to go inside and check it out. No way, he tells him as he pulls his hand back from feeling inside the cave wall, his palm now coated in a sickly slime. It's gross in there. The other two laugh at him. If they think they're so brave, why don't the two of them go check it out? The two men stop laughing and look at each other. Who could have ever foreseen the tables turning on them like this? But they're not going to back down. One of the two takes out a flashlight and they step into the cave while the third waits outside. He watches as the two of them head deeper into the cave, disappearing behind the bend. Inside the cave, the floor is just like the walls, coated with some kind of substance making it wet, but also a little sticky. They half expected the cave to end right around the bend, but now they can see that it continues on. Not only is there another turn several meters ahead of them, but as they head deeper in, they find that there are branching paths too, this might just be the start of a vast cave system. There's no telling how far or how deep it might go. They better head back to the entrance before they get lost. The two turn around to start heading back towards the entrance. But wait, what was that? When they spin around. It sounded like there was a noise behind them. But there's nothing there, just the empty passageway. They must be hearing things. They really should get out of here quickly, though. Come on, let's go. As they turn to leave, though, something happens. With a sickening squishing sound, the walls of the tunnel constrict, closing up between them. He runs towards the now-closed passage and starts slapping at the moist, soft wall, but there's no response. But then he does hear something. Was that a scream? He's realized something else, too. Even though his friend had the flashlight, he can still see. While faint, the walls themselves seem to be producing a small amount of light. He yells out that he's going to get help and that his friend should hold tight and not move. He'll get him out of there. He has no idea if he can hear him, though. He starts to slowly make his way back the way he thinks they came, but the cave feels different. He's taking turns that he doesn't remember making on their short trip. He should be at the entrance already, and there seem to be more branching paths than there were before. It's hard to tell in the low light, though. Maybe he's just confused. He's hearing noises, too. Wet, writhing sounds. He's got to get out of here. The quarry worker reaches a fork in the tunnel and has no idea which is the right way to go. He doesn't remember this at all. He calls down the tunnel, but there's no answer to his cries. He hears more of those wet, slapping sounds behind him, though. He's got to keep moving. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The left tunnel it is. He goes down his chosen path, rounds a corner, and sees another fork. What is going on here? He's got to pick, though. Eeny, meeny, miny. He screams as something leaps out of the tunnel at him. Outside the cave, the quarry worker is growing nervous. He's gotten a flashlight of his own and shines it down the tunnel, 
but he can't see any more than they could before. He calls out, asking if they're all right, but he's met only with silence. He turns around behind him at the empty quarry. They're the only ones working on the site that day. And if they don't get back to work soon, there's going to be some angry questions about why they spent the day horsing around inside of a cave. As much as he hates the idea, he's got to go in there and get them out. He enters the cave and goes around the first bend. He too notices how oddly sticky and slimy every surface is, but he has to press on. Maybe they were hurt and needed his help. He rounds another bend and spots something, a pair of legs sticking out from around the next turn. His friend must really have been hurt. He runs towards his injured co-worker and kneels down next to him. It looks like he's passed out on the ground and he tries to shake him awake. Are you okay? What happened? His friend moans a bit, but doesn't even open his eyes. He moans again, and this time blood starts pouring out of his mouth. The quarry worker steps back, scared at the sight of his friend's state. That's when he notices something. His friend's stomach. It's moving. He leans in close. He can see bumps swelling and moving around his abdomen. Is that? The SCP Foundation soon learned of the troubling reports and moved quickly to purchase the quarry and the surrounding lands. Those who had seen or heard rumors about the missing workers were amnestitized, and all further access to the area around the quarry was strictly controlled. The cave itself that had been unearthed was designated SCP-2385, but the Foundation needed to learn just what they were dealing with. So after a research outpost was constructed over the entrance, the investigation into what was happening inside this strange anomalous cavern system could finally begin. The first to enter the cave is D-11424, a Class D personnel, who is equipped with a shoulder-mounted camera, a Ruger LC-9 pistol, a machete, and one week's worth of rations, since it was unknown just how vast this cave system may be. D-11424 proceeds into the cave and immediately reports back the same conditions that the workers had experienced that the surfaces of the cave were soft, wet, and a little sticky, and also that they seemed to have an almost imperceptible glow. D-11424 moves deeper into the cave, but sees no sign of the missing workers, despite one of their bodies having been reported as being lost relatively close to the entrance. He's ordered to continue deeper into the cave, and radios back that the walls weren't stable. He would pass by openings in the walls that would seal off once he was passed, on more than one occasion, he saw new passages open up as well, and these didn't appear to be caused by collapses or other geological activity. The walls seemed like they were… alive. But the walls were the only sign of life he could find. There was still no evidence of the missing workers or whatever might have gotten them. But then, after D-11424 rounds a corner, he sees that something is up ahead of him. It's not one of the workers. It's a creature and one that looks like nothing he has ever seen before. The thing crawling on the floor of the cave looks like a giant worm, several feet in length, but with a grotesque, skinless human head. D-11424, frightened at the sight of this grotesque creature, turns to run, but it's too late. The worm has spotted him and charges at him immediately, slithering across the wet cave floor at an incredible speed. D-11424 slips and falls to the ground. His shoulder-mounted camera knocked off his body and left facing a wall, leaving the researchers monitoring the feed with nothing except the sound of his screams. Once contact was lost with the Class D personnel, the Foundation decided that due to the presence of hostile creatures within the cave system, that the next exploratory expedition would be undertaken without humans. The mission was authorized, and two months later, a remote-controlled drone designated A-47 was sent into the cave. Just like D-11424 and the quarry workers before saw, its camera captures passageways opening and closing in the living rock walls. As it progresses deeper, it eventually spots the same worm-like creatures with horrible human faces that look like they've had their skin removed, which have now been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2385-1 entities. And A-47 soon discovers a surprising fact about these bizarre organisms. They appear that they are being birthed right from the walls of the cave itself. As A-47 enters one of those largest rooms yet seen in the cave, its camera captures over a dozen 2385-1s growing out of the walls and ceiling in various stages of maturity. Some of them snap at A-47 as it passes by, trying to attack the drone, but luckily they're unable to reach. There's larger examples of the worms in the room too, and these ones also differ in appearance slightly, with a fibrous growth over their eyes. 
The researchers assume that these entities are different enough from the smaller versions that they warrant their own classification, and are designated as SCP-2385-2 entities. Luckily for A-47, these larger specimens, which can be as large as 4 meters in length, seem much more docile than their smaller counterparts and ignore A-47 as it passes by. A-47 then learns another shocking piece of information about these disturbing worm-like creatures. They're cannibalistic. Its camera relays footage back to the research team of a 2385-1 entity feeding on another, smaller one. It appears that they eat their prey whole after unhinging their grotesque jaws. The one feeding tries to lash out at A-47 with its tail, but can't reach him with half of another instance in its mouth, and the drone continues deeper into the cave. Just when A-47 enters the next chamber, a 2385-1 instance growing out of the ceiling drops down right in front of it, leaving no way for the drone to get around it in the narrow section of cave. A-47 quickly turns around to seek out another path, but its camera captures the passage closing in front of it. A-47 is trapped. The 2385-1 entity charges towards the remote-controlled drone and attacks, biting and slapping it with its powerful tail. It then attempts to consume it, but is unable to ingest the bulky drone and, instead, leaves the heavily damaged robot for dead, slithering away deeper into the cave. The battered drone lies immobile on the cave floor for several hours, its camera broadcasting until the last of its battery is finally about to run out. Just before it stops sending signals back to the research outpost, though, it captures something. The wall next to A-47 opens up, and two of the larger SCP-2385-2 entities emerge from the new passageway. One of them approaches A-47, as the other probes at the wall next to it with its head. It seems as though the larger of the entities are actually able to form new pathways in the cave, or at least open up doorways between existing ones. With the last of its battery power, A-47 sends back a truly remarkable sight. Out of the hole opened by the 2385-2 entity appears D-11424. He's dirty, disheveled, sporting a month's worth of beard growth, and brandishing a machete. The wall opens up from the Dash-2 entity prodding at it, and the odd group exits through it. It's the last thing A-47 transmits back to the Foundation. Two months later, after several more failed manned missions, there was finally a success. An SCP-2385-2 instance that had wandered close to the entrance was retrieved from the cave system and brought back to a Foundation research site where a camera was surgically implanted in its head. The entity, which was designated as Subject Alpha, or SA, was then amnestitized and released back into the 2385 caves, allowing researchers to monitor how it behaved as it traveled through its home environment. The researchers watched as SA made its way through the cave system and stopped in another of the rooms filled with young versions of 2385-1. The larger entity approached several and appeared to nuzzle its face against theirs before moving on, which looked to have a calming effect on the extremely aggressive smaller versions. As it continues through the tunnels, SA sees a group of 2385-1 instances feeding on a deceased 2385-2. It appears that when 2385-1s are unable to swallow their prey whole, they burrow into the body and consume them from the inside out. Luckily, they are too distracted by their meal to pay any attention to SA, and it is able to pass by. SA then runs into two other 2385-2 entities, and the three begin traveling through the caves together. They are soon attacked by a smaller Dash-1, but the group is able to pin the biting and thrashing entity to the ground with their powerful tails, allowing SA to nuzzle it. Just like with the ones being birthed from the wall, this seems to calm the creature but there is another effect as well. As the 2385-1 entity becomes more docile, the same fibrous growths that can be seen on the larger 2385-2 entities start to grow over its eyes. Is this how 2385-2s are created? The group of Dash 2s continues their journey through the tunnels, often stopping to prod at the walls to open new pathways. It appears that they are searching for something, looking around each new room they enter before moving on. Eventually, they run into something, but it doesn't appear to be what they wanted to find. They enter a new section of cave, and blocking the path in front of them is the largest SCP-2385-1 entity yet recorded. It's as big as the Dash 2s at over 7 meters in length and weighing an estimated 400 kilograms. It appears to be extremely hostile, but the Dash 2s seem to instinctively know that the only way forward is to go past this massive Dash 1. The trio nuzzles their heads together, as if they are saying one final goodbye before one of the Dash 2s charges straight ahead. The Dash 1 attacks and quickly incapacitates it with its powerful tail and snapping jaws. 
It begins feeding on the Dash 2, giving S.A. and its one remaining companion the time they need to get past. As the now duo moves past, the other is attacked from a side tunnel by a group of regular-sized but ferocious Dash 1s. S.A. can't do anything to help. It seems to pick up the pace and continues on, but as it rounds a corner, it comes face to face with another large Dash 1 instance. It turns down a side tunnel to avoid it, but finds itself in a dead end. It prods at the wall as the Dash 1 rushes towards it, but no new passageways open. It turns around, seemingly resigned to its fate as the Dash 1 begins attacking. But just then, something else appears in the tunnel coming towards them. It's D-11424, charging forward with his machete raised in the air, his hair and beard both long and wild. He begins fighting the large Dash 1 entity, hacking at it with his machete until it finally dies. With the vicious entity now dead, he kneels down next to S.A. and begins stroking its head in a calming manner. Hey there, little guy. You all right? He asks as he pets the 2385-2. Yeah, you're fine. Get up. I know where it is. Come with me. S.A. struggles from its injuries, but is able to follow D-11424 as he leads it through the tunnels. With D-11424 stopping at one point to carve a piece off of the fleshy walls and consume it. The tunnels eventually open up into a large room that looks similar to the rest of the cave system, except there is a huge glowing orb at its center. It's a beautiful sphere of warm light that appears to be at least 10 meters in diameter. Here we are, the D-Class tells S.A. and motions towards the orb. It's alright. S.A. nuzzles against D-11424, perhaps one final thank you for saving its life, then instinctually seems to know what to do. The camera feed shows that it began crawling towards the sphere, and after a brief pause, started pushing itself inside. The camera recorded the brilliant light of the orb engulfing S.A. and its implanted camera before the feed finally cut out. The SCP Foundation would later discover that on that very same day, in the city of Elgin, Illinois, a local woman was admitted to the hospital after complaining of abdominal pains. Doctors performed emergency surgery and found something they did not expect. A micro camera had somehow become embedded inside of her body, which upon later investigations would be found to bear the same serial number as the one that had been implanted in S.A. Following this strange event, SCP-2385, which had previously been classified as Euclid, was upgraded to Keter. An observation site has been built at the quarry and no further human expeditions are allowed inside. In a bit of good news, sometime later, D-11424 finally emerged from the cave system. He was taken back into SCP Foundation custody and continues engaging in exploratory missions on behalf of the Foundation to this day. Now go and watch SCP-002, The Living Room, to find out about another bizarre location that may just be more than meets the eye. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. A man wakes up with a start. Did something just bite him? He looks down at his hand. Something definitely bit him. He can see the red welt already forming. He looks around for the culprit, but can't find it anywhere. He really hopes he doesn't have bed bugs. That's the last thing he needs right now. He'll have to keep his eyes open for potential pests. He doesn't want this to happen again, since the spot is already starting to itch and feel uncomfortable. A couple days pass, though, with no signs of other bugs. It must have just been a random insect that came inside his house to escape the winter cold. The spot on his hand felt a little rough for a day or two, but now he's pretty much forgotten all about it. Now what he really needs is some coffee before sitting down to another coating session. The man is in his kitchen trying to make a fresh pot of coffee, but finds he's having a hard time. He's not so much making coffee as he is making a mess. He knocks his favorite mug onto the ground, breaking it, and decides that maybe he doesn't need coffee after all. A couple of nights later, as the man is watching TV, he starts to cough. Just a little at first, but then more and more. The coughing fits get longer and deeper too, like they are coming from the very bottom of his lungs. He hopes he isn't coming down with something. He hasn't left the house in days, so how could he have? Can bugs transfer colds? He'll have to look it up later. For now, he needs to do something about this cough. He won't be able to sleep if it keeps up. He needs to go get some medicine. The man gets bundled up and heads out. It's lightly snowing as he walks to the pharmacy and he can't help but admire the way the moon hangs in the sky, a beautiful beacon of light on this dark winter evening. Inside the pharmacy, he finds the cold medicine section and picks out a cough suppressant. 
He takes it to the counter and decides to get a few candy bars, too. He's developed a real sweet tooth these last few days. The man starts to cough again. It's a good thing he's getting this medicine. Several more days pass, and the man isn't feeling any better. This cough just won't go away. He decides it's finally time to go see a doctor. As he sits in the doctor's office waiting room, he does his best to hold in his coughs, but he has a very hard time. The woman on the other side of the room is coughing too. Strangely, it actually makes him feel a little better. There must just be something going around. A nurse comes into the waiting room and calls his name. The doctor is ready for him. The man is sitting on the bed in the examination room when the doctor enters. He's looking over his medical records and doesn't even look up from his clipboard. He tells the man to take off his shirt so that he can be examined, and the man obliges. Okay, let's see what the trouble is, the doctor says. He finally looks up at the man and screams. It didn't take long for the SCP Foundation to hear the reports of people's limbs metamorphosing into insectoid appendages, and they knew immediately what they were dealing with. This was another outbreak of the parasitic, limb-transforming insect known as SCP-150. SCP-150 is an obligate parasite, meaning that it requires a host for the completion of its reproductive life cycle. It bears a visual appearance similar to that of Cymothoa exigua, another parasite that eats the tongue of a particular type of fish before replacing the tongue with its own body. SCP-150 engages in similar behavior, though it appears to exclusively affect humans. When a human comes in contact with a small, bug-like organism, it will embed itself under its new host's skin. Next, over the course of roughly seven days, SCP-150 will burrow deep into the host's flesh and begin to cause numerous physiological changes to them. First, and most prominently, SCP-150 will begin a gradual process of altering the limb that is nearest to the original infection site. As SCP-150 burrows deeper and consumes the flesh, it excretes a substance that has the effect of replacing the missing sections of the limb with a hard, chitinous material that resembles one of its own appendages. Beneath the chitin, the excreted substance forms a rudimentary nervous system that gives the host the ability to control the new limb as if it were their own. As it feeds, SCP-150 also secretes several chemicals that contain anesthetic, immunosuppressant, and transplant-rejecting properties that keep the host's body from responding to the changes, or even reacting at all. In fact, the host will often report that their new limb is completely normal and feels stronger and more resilient after the transformation. SCP-150 will continue to feed for approximately one to two weeks, and as it feeds on the nutrients within its host's body, it will begin to reproduce, creating eggs that it deposits directly into the bloodstream. While the majority of these eggs will die off, enough usually survive to begin colonizing other parts of the host's body, where they will hatch and repeat the process of feeding, reproducing, and spreading more eggs. It is theorized that it is capable of reproducing on its own, meaning that a single instance of SCP-150 is all it takes to create a new colony. Humans infected with SCP-150 will sometimes report slight discomfort and issues with their fine motor skills during this period, but will usually not express any knowledge of what might be causing this. Eventually, SCP-150 eggs will reach the host's lungs, where the process of assimilating continues, this time replacing the lungs themselves. During this process, more eggs will be produced, laid, and then spread out of the body by the host's coughing. As many as 10,000 eggs will be produced during this period, approximately 1% of which will survive being expelled, find another host, and implant themselves. The assimilation process then spreads to the central nervous system, including the spinal cord and brain, but strangely, the host will show no signs that their consciousness or behavior have been affected in any way. In interviews with hosts of SCP-150, those who are unaware that they are infected have not expressed any knowledge of changes happening in or out of their body. When subjects are made aware that they have been infected, they will be able to point out the site of the original infection and agree that a change has taken place, but they seem to have no ill will towards their new chitinous appendages and will often express positive feelings about it. In order to better study the effects of SCP-150 under SCP Foundation control, two D-Class personnel, D-13732 and D-016002, were both infected with the parasites, and the assimilation process was allowed to fully progress through all the stages. 
Following signs that D016002 was experiencing swelling of the brain, a decompressive craniotomy was performed, a procedure in which a portion of the skull is removed in order to relieve pressure on the brain. This surgery had the added benefit of giving Foundation researchers the chance to look at SCP-150's progress firsthand. But after a flap of her skull was removed, the attending scientists did not find that her brain was swelling. They didn't find her brain at all, but instead observed numerous instances of SCP-150 in the cavity where her brain should be. The D-Class had been partially anesthetized to numb her skull but remained conscious during the procedure, and the scientists asked her several simple questions to which she was perfectly able to answer. They began removing some of the parasites, and as they did so, her answers became slower and less clear. It appeared that the SCP-150 instances had not just eaten and replaced her brain, they had become her brain. For the next experiment, they would use the instances of SCP-150 that had been removed from D-13732's nervous system after he had been euthanized following the discovery that his entire nervous system had also been replaced entirely by SCP-150. The parasites taken from his brain cavity were placed into D-016002s, and the results were nothing short of incredible. After observing a period of time where the organisms appeared to move and rearrange themselves within her skull, she regained consciousness. Once awake, not only did her cognitive functions immediately improve, when she was asked to state her name, she told them it was Michael, D-13732's name. It is unknown why SCP-150 engages in this peculiar life cycle, but the danger it poses to humans and the difficulty in keeping it contained has led the SCP Foundation to classify it as Keter. Some of the more erudite researchers have taken to calling the parasite the Ship of Theseus, a play on the philosophical notion that questions whether something that has had all of its parts replaced is still fundamentally the same, or if it has become something new. Perhaps the observation of those infected with SCP-150 can shed some light on this millennia-old question. Infected patients who are being studied are to be kept in level 3 biohazard containment cells, with never more than one infected host per cell. Cultures of SCP-150 adults and eggs are kept in vacuum-sealed glass flasks in the Site-42 Infectious Materials Lab, and the Foundation's standard pathogen handling procedures are required to be followed at all times. Should any instance of SCP-150 be found outside of containment, it is to be immediately incinerated. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives. You'll be starting out with cold cases, the police chief tells the detective who has just arrived for his first day at the precinct. We've got more than enough to keep you busy, so head on down to the archives and get started. The new detective is looking forward to taking on these unsolved crimes. Cracking the overlooked and long since forgotten cases is one of his specialties, and it brings him great joy to solve the puzzles that no one else has been able to. The detective heads to a part of the police station that doesn't look like it sees much foot traffic, where he finds the door labeled Archives. Inside the room, the air is musty, and when the detective sets down his bag on a table, a thick cloud of dust is ejected and makes him sneeze. He takes out the list of cases he's supposed to be working on, and goes to a shelf containing rows and rows of evidence boxes. He pulls one down and starts looking through the files inside. It's full of police reports, witness statements, crime scene photos, and even bits of evidence. Hours pass as the detective goes down his list, looking through box after box, report after report. He finds that it's best to take a cursory survey first and see if anything leaps out at him, before drilling down to start combing through the details. As he pulls down the last box from his list of cases that the chief told him to work on, he notices something. High up on a shelf, nestled among the many identical cardboard boxes, is what looks to be a piece of leather luggage. He can't help but wonder what this is doing here in the archives. Is it a piece of evidence from another case that got left here for some reason? Or did someone simply forget their bag after they finished looking through old files? Whatever the reason it's here, he has a job to do, and investigating this bag isn't on his list. But then again, he knows he won't be able to focus until he knows what this bag is and what's inside. He'll let himself take just a quick peek, then it's back to work. The detective returns to the shelf with the bag. It looks like it's been here for a long time. There's a layer of dust covering it that's as thick as anything else in the room. He takes it down and blows the dust off the bag. 
He unlatches it, and inside he finds... a folder. Is this just another report? But what's it doing here? Maybe they ran out of boxes one day and someone decided to use an old briefcase instead. The detective takes out the folder and opens it. Just as he suspected, it is another case report. It's only a single page, though, with several photographs paperclipped to it. He takes the photos off the report and begins looking through them. They appear to be numbered in order, and the first picture shows a mess of red liquid and chunks of what might be meat or bone. The next two show various angles of a badly mutilated corpse. It's been so violently mangled, though, that the victim is barely even recognizable as a human. The detective paperclips the photos back to the report and puts it back in the case. If this murder only has one page of evidence to work with, then he is classifying it as a revisit after literally everything else in the room is solved kind of case. The detective goes back to the last box that he was looking through and starts flipping through the case files again, but something about that leather briefcase and the photos inside won't get out of his mind. Maybe there is something there. Without even realizing it, he's suddenly standing over the case again. He takes out the report and starts looking through the pictures once more. Again, he sees the disfigured corpse from different angles, but the fourth picture is completely different. This one shows what looks to be someone's feet, but they're up in the air, as if they jumped and took a picture of their shoes. There's something wrong with the picture, too. Some kind of odd discoloration around the edges. It looks like an error occurred in the development process. Why would this be in a case file? It's tugging at his curiosity. But no, he really shouldn't be spending his time on this, not on his first day at a new job. The detective places everything back in the case and puts it back up on the shelf where he found it before deciding to call it a day. That night, he finds that he can't sleep. The detective keeps seeing the disfigured face every time he closes his eyes. And why the picture of floating feet? What does it all mean? His mind is racing, trying to make sense of it all. By the time his alarm starts beeping, the detective realizes that he hasn't slept at all. Later that morning, the detective is back in the chief's office again. The chief tells him that he looks awful and asks if the job is getting to him already. The detective does look terrible, and something about the room is making him very uncomfortable. The ceiling feels too low, like it moved down a foot or two since the last time he was here. It's also very dim. Who can operate in such a dark room? He stands up and asks if he can turn on some more lights, and before the chief can answer, he switches on more. The chief squints from the bright fluorescent lights coming on and tells the detective to get back to work and to make sure he gets some sleep that night. If he can't, then maybe this job isn't for him. The detective returns to the archives to pick up where he left off the day before and goes back to looking through the files on his list. But of course, that leather briefcase always seems to be right in his field of view, reaching out to him, begging him to uncover its secrets. That's it, the detective thinks. He has no choice. He has to know what's going on with this file. He takes the briefcase down again, opens the report, and starts going through the photos again. Three pictures of a gross corpse check. Picture four showing someone's feet. Nothing new there. Now it's time to finally look at the rest. The fifth picture is similar to the fourth, but the person's feet look a little closer to the ground. Wait a minute. Are these in reverse order? He looks at the next. This one doesn't have anyone in it. It's a picture of a table, and it looks like there is writing on it, though the writing is very small. He leans in close and squints, but he still can't make it out. He runs to his own bag and searches around until he finds what he was looking for, a magnifying glass. He goes back to the picture, and with the magnifying glass he can finally read the writing. It's above you. He snaps his head up and looks above him, but nothing is there. He laughs to himself. Of course nothing is there. Maybe the chief is right. Maybe something really is getting to him and he isn't cut out for this job. But still, he needs to learn more. He looks at the seventh picture. He sees now that he was right. These are definitely in reverse chronological order. In the next picture, he sees whoever took the photos approaching the table in the room. In the tenth photo, he sees them walking through a doorway. In the eleventh, he sees them opening the door to the room. Finally, he comes to the last photo. It's a photo of the closed door to the room. There's writing on the door, and the detective can hardly believe what he is seeing when he reads it. The writing on the door says, Archives. The detective jumps up and spins around, but the room is empty. There's no one here but him. What's going on? Is this some kind of prank? He 
picks up the report the pictures were attached to, there must be some answers in there. The paper appears to be a standard police report that was filled out following the discovery of a homicide. The top of the page lists the address where the murder took place. It's the very place he is now, the police station's address. Next to it is the date. It's impossible, though. The date is... today's. Archives can hold untold secrets, and many of those are often quite dangerous, as anyone familiar with the SCP Foundation is already well aware. Rarely is the file in the archive itself the danger, but that is exactly the case with SCP-767, a deadly series of crime scene photos that are anything but what they seem. SCP-767 is the designation for a series of anomalous objects which were recovered from a police department's own archives. They include a series of 12 Polaroid photographs, which have been given the designation SCP-767-1 through 12, that appear to be the source of the anomalous properties surrounding the objects. Each photograph is labeled 1 through 12 in the lower left-hand corner, though they appear to be labeled in reverse chronological order. When viewed in reverse, that is, starting with the picture labeled 12, the photos depict a first-person perspective of someone entering a room and examining a table. The table will have writing on it, which alternates between the iterations of SCP-767, and will either read, It's above you, or On the ceiling, written with a red substance that appears to be fresh blood. The next photos continue to be from a first-person perspective, and will show the person taking the photos being lifted up into the air above the table, with wisps of black smoke visible around the edges of the frame, that look at first glance like either photo development issues or damage to the picture. The final three pictures depict a fresh corpse that has been so heavily mutilated by lacerations that it is completely unrecognizable, while the last picture shows a body that appears to have been virtually liquefied in some way, with gore and viscera spread around the room. The origin of these photos is unknown, and it's unknown if they were ever taken at all or merely manifested in some way. When the photos are taken to a new location and are allowed to remain there for one week, they will change to reflect a room within the building where they are being kept, with the individual portrayed in the photos being an image of the last person to experience the photo's frightening effects. More on what those are later. The ability of SCP-767 to change based on the location it is in is also present in SCP-767-13 and 14, which are the police report and the brown leather valise that always accompany the photos. The police report has an address and date at the top, both of which will somehow change to reflect the current date and location of SCP-767, while the leather briefcase has a gold monogram on it that will change to whatever the name is of the owner or head of the structure that it is contained in. But that is far from where the anomalous properties of SCP-767 end. Individuals who are exposed to the photographs will experience a wide range of effects that are based on how far into the photo series they look. Those that view SCP-767-1 through 3 will report feeling no special effects, besides the normal reaction one has to seeing a badly mutilated corpse, with most describing the photos as weird or disturbing. Those that view the photos labeled 4 through 6, though, will usually report that they have developed feelings of claustrophobia, with many also reporting a newfound bout of nyctophobia, that is, fear of the dark, or more specifically, a fear of the potential for bad things to happen in the dark. These fears will also vary in intensity based on how many of the photos were viewed. Subjects who are exposed to the 7th, 8th, and 9th photos will feel an overwhelming desire to inspect the ceiling, and most are observed snapping their heads upwards immediately after reading the writing on the table in the photo. In later interviews, subjects have described the feeling as instinctual or as if someone had yelled the words at them like a warning. Following this, the subject will experience a sensation of being watched and will usually report having persistent chills. Those who view the final three photos will appear to suffer a fear-induced paralysis effect when they attempt to move away from the photos. A shadowy, black, effervescent mass will begin to form on the ceiling directly above the subject, which has been designated SCP-767-15, though the presence of this mass has only been reported by in-person witnesses, as it doesn't appear on photographic or video recordings. Tendrils of the gaseous material will reach down from the mass and grab the affected subject, lifting them up into the air before violently attacking them. The subject will suffer deep lacerations as the tendrils cut into it before it completely destroys them leaving them as little more than a pool of blood and pieces of flesh. The nature of this dark cloud of gas, where it comes from, or why it engages in this behavior is currently unknown, 
and attempts to stop it once it has gotten hold of its victim have only led to those who intervene being pushed away by a powerful force, with all weapons passing harmlessly through the mass. In the time since its discovery by the SCP Foundation, multiple other unsolved cases of victims that appear to suffer similar fates have been identified, and investigations into whether they are connected to SCP-767 and the 767-15 entity are ongoing. The SCP-767-1-12 through photos are to be kept inside of the SCP-767-13 report, which is itself stored within the brown leather SCP-767-14 valise, and the entire group is kept at an SCP Foundation Hazardous Item Secure Containment Center. Due to the little we understand about its nature or origin, the entirety of the anomalous objects that make up SCP-767, including the SCP-767-15 entity, have been classified as Euclid and any access to the objects requires written authorization from at least one Level 4 Site Administrator. SCP-767 may not be the most dangerous file in the SCP Foundation's archive, but it may just be the most dangerous, literal file. There are plenty other surprisingly dangerous objects that can impact you in ways you never expected though, like SCP-1875, the antique chess automaton that is capable of powerful effects that you have to see to believe. Go watch that file examination right now, and don't forget to subscribe to be the first to learn about the next anomaly from the SCP Foundation's classified archives. It's Saturday night, and a teenaged boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall, with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little… off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone. But they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's… them. A pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them. They look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as my face that I may be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below the mall, deep underground, 
something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site 81715, an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81-715. These instances are considered hostile, and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed and what exactly the pit is are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715A instances exist down in the pit. With the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces, SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. The Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter, and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B, who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715-B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher Doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. 
Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher Doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B, and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715, the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. Do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715-B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit, and what will they do should they ever get out? Investigations are ongoing. A small convertible sports car rumbles down a desert road, kicking up a cloud of dust high into the air behind it. The driver is sharply dressed and looks at himself in the rearview mirror, giving his sunglasses a slight adjustment. He knows he looks as good as he feels. And why shouldn't the producer of Hollywood's ninth most successful film in the month of September be happy? The car comes to a sudden stop in front of a cluster of buildings, which appear to be the only structures in this vast, otherwise empty desert. The producer hops out of the car and surveys the desolate location. The cracked concrete airstrip, the weather-beaten buildings, the endless, lonely desert stretching on for miles in every direction. This place is great, the producer says out loud to no one in particular. The whole location would be perfect for his new movie, which is set entirely at a desert airstrip, and tells the story of a lonely airplane mechanic who falls in love with a female bounty hunter chasing an escaped convict, a tale as old as time. But now, where's the guy who called him? He kept rambling about wanting to make a documentary about the desert or something, but that doesn't matter now. He doesn't realize what a great filming location he's sitting on. The producer calls out, Hello? But the only response is the desert breeze. He takes off his sunglasses and looks around. He sees that the doors to the hangar are cracked. Maybe the guy who owns this place is in there. The producer walks inside the hangar, but abruptly stops. His mouth goes agape. He can't believe what he's seeing. This place is even better than the guy on the phone had described it. The hangar is huge and completely empty. He could probably build almost all the sets in the hangar, maybe even shoot the entire picture out here. He'd save a fortune on the budget by not having to pay the soundstage rates that the studios charge on the movie lots in LA. You beautiful genius, he thinks to himself. The movie could flop and still be a financial success. But where's the guy who called him? Doesn't he know who he is? He's a very important producer and doesn't have time to wait around for some desert nobody who runs a two-bit airport. All right, that's it. He's leaving. The producer turns to leave, but the doors of the hangar suddenly slide shut with a bang. Is this some kind of joke? He walks up to the hangar doors and starts banging on them, but they don't move. Hello? Hey, I'm trapped in here. What's the big deal? Still no response. Just what is going on at this place? The producer is getting worried. Was this some kind of a setup? Is he about to get robbed? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if they took his car. He's nine payments behind on it anyway. But geez, is it hot in here. It was hot outside, but it's even worse in this hangar. And whoever said that the desert air was dry? An idiot, that's who. 
The humidity in here is stifling. The producer loosens his collar and tugs at it, trying to cool off. All right, I've had just about enough. If you don't let me out of here, there's going to be a big problem for you, fella. Just then, the producer hears a noise behind him, coming from the dark deeper in the hangar. The producer doesn't react, though. He needs to play it cool. He bends down and pretends to tie his shoe, and takes the Derringer pistol out of his ankle holster. He stands up and spins around, pointing the gun in front of him, but he can't see anyone in the darkness. This is your last chance. I'm not playing around here. The strange noise comes again, a low rumbling noise, and the producer stumbles forward. What just happened? It felt like the floor rippled and pushed him forward. There, it happened again. And again, the producer screams. What's going on? The rumbling, growling noise grows louder as the floor keeps rippling and pushing him forward, like a wave rolling through the solid ground. Is this an earthquake? The producer is knocked off his feet, and still the floor keeps pushing him forward, towards where that horrible growling noise is coming from. He tries to stand, but he can't. The floor is moving too much. He tries to crawl, but keeps getting moved closer and closer to the source of the now deafening roar that seems to be coming from… What is that? The producer screams and fires his gun at the thing in front of him. In the flashes of the gunfire, he can finally see it, the thing that he's being pushed into, a giant, gaping maw, filled with a mass of gnashing, grinding teeth. How unlucky for this movie producer that he didn't realize until it was too late that the location for his new movie would be the last one that he'd ever scout. Because as you have probably already figured out, this unknown building in the middle of the desert isn't at all what it appears to be. And in fact, is quite known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-1051. SCP-1051 isn't actually a building at all, but in fact, is a living organism. This creature's shell, which resembles an aircraft hangar, is quite large and measures roughly 700 meters by 500 meters by 60 meters. It is a completely immobile organism and acts as an ambush predator, luring its prey to it through a number of different forms of sociological and psychological manipulation. SCP-1051 attempts to bring prey to it in a number of ways, but its primary method is by spreading certain ideas into popular culture. It will constantly try to connect to orbiting satellites and use them to beam out television signals, images, and other forms of media. It has been measured as having around a 25% success rate in connecting with and getting its message carried by the satellites, and may have the ability to transmit regular radio broadcasts or connect to standard telephone lines as well. The messages that SCP-1051 sends out tend to fall into the category that could be termed as conspiracy theories, most of which are about itself. It has uploaded information to various conspiracy websites that has included reports of spaceships being held and reverse-engineered in its hangar, descriptions of so-called men in black using its location as a site for extraterrestrial contact. It has attempted to spread rumors that it is a site used as a testing location for any number of top-secret devices including energy weapons, weather control devices, teleportation machines, and impossible propulsion systems. SCP-1051 has also attempted to spread through radio and television transmissions that it is a site used by a United States shadow government. It's made at least a handful of calls to Hollywood-based production companies in an attempt to get them to further spread its information, as well as contacting various tabloid newspapers. Perhaps most nefarious of all, it has even sent orders to U.S. military intelligence operatives posing as a senior official and ordering them to reveal SCP-1051's location. SCP-1051 appears desperate to make its location known to curious outsiders, all in an attempt to get them to come find it, so it can lure them inside of itself and feed. And the anatomical structure of SCP-1051 is perfectly suited to this task. Its bizarre biological structure consists of a large tongue, which looks very similar to a paved runway. The tongue leads directly into a set of large airplane hangar doors that could be called the organism's mouth. This door mouth opens up to what looks like a hangar, but is actually the gizzard-like organ of 1051, where it grinds its prey into a fine paste to prepare it for digestion. The next building is the creature's stomach where it breaks down the liquefied prey into nutrients and separates the waste products that it can't digest. The nutrients are transported to the area where SCP-1051's brain is thought to reside, while the waste is ejected out of the structure. Finally, there are what appears to be a set of antenna on the side of the building. These information distribution organs extend below the ground as well, where many more antenna and wires are thought to exist, 
and give 1051 the ability to send out multiple television, radio, and other signals. SCP-1051 was discovered in 1947, when an egg-shaped structure was reported to have crash-landed in the desert of the American Southwest, near the town of Roswell, New Mexico. The United States Air Force took this strange egg into its possession and moved it to its current location in Nevada for observation and research. The Air Force scientists who were assigned to the object first thought that they were dealing with a meteorite, the one that was composed of some yet unknown material. They soon discovered that the object was hollow and was filled with some kind of liquid. Strangest of all, though, was when they detected something inside that liquid core. And it was moving. They studied the object for years, until one day, something happened that would end their research for good. The egg hatched. One night, as Air Force Sergeant Burnson and two scientists, Dr. James and Dr. Gold, were going about their regular work analyzing the object, they heard a strange sound. When they looked at the object, they saw that a crack had begun to form on the outer shell. This cracking continued for about five minutes, until something finally broke through the shell. An alien creature began to emerge from its shell, and the men all turned to run, but something reached out with a long tentacle-like arm and grabbed Dr. James. It pulled the scientist in and seemed to absorb him right into its body. Sergeant Burnson and Dr. Gold managed to escape the airplane hangar and send out a distress signal, and it was this cry for help that described an attack by an alien creature that would put the object firmly on the SCP Foundation's radar. As Sergeant Burnson was sending out the distress signal, Dr. Gold tapped him on the shoulder and pointed towards the hangar where the egg-like object had been stored. The two men watched as the hangar bulged and expanded like something was pressing against the walls from inside. The hangar suddenly collapsed, and they watched as the creature looked to writhe around in the debris. But then a new shell began to form around the alien. It grew larger, expanding and shifting until suddenly it took on nearly the exact form as the hangar that once stood there. SCP Foundation agents arrived at the site not long after and took control of the area. They discovered almost immediately that the building-shaped creature was anything but dormant. This extraterrestrial that had been born from an egg and then taken the form of an airplane hangar was ejecting its own eggs. The building would occasionally blast eggs up and into the sky. Several of these eggs were stopped and reclaimed by the Foundation, but others managed to slip past and escape the Earth's atmosphere, making them impossible to recover. The Foundation also soon detected that radio signals were being emitted by the hangar, and set up a small radio nearby which would allow them to both receive and send signals back to the creature that was now designated as SCP-1051. Dr. Richardson, the Foundation researcher on site who was leading the investigation into 1051, found the frequency that it was transmitting on and attempted to speak to the creature. After asking if 1051 could hear it, the creature actually responded and it seemed to have a very simple request, give. When Dr. Richardson asked it to elaborate, asking, give what? 1051 responded, want feed, bring food. When the doctor told 1051 that it wouldn't be getting any food, the anomaly immediately sent out a new transmission, stating, Area 51 is currently being controlled by the SCP Foundation, a shadow government organization that has designated it SCP-1051, here are a few names of the operatives. Dr. Richardson cut SCP-1051 off and ordered a D-Class personnel to be sent inside the creature, hopefully appeasing it and stopping it from sending any more broadcasts out about the highly secretive organization. When asked why it was sending these signals, SCP-1051 responded that it was trying to make humans curious. It appeared that its hunting strategy was to flood the world with conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories about itself. This would then cause interested humans to come explore the location, and once they entered the hangar, their curiosity would reward them with an encounter with the alien that they had been seeking. SCP-1051 also explained that the eggs that it was ejecting were its babies, and it seemed quite upset that the Foundation had intercepted some of them as they were on their orbital escape trajectory. But where had SCP-1051 come up with these conspiracy theories? Had it been studying our culture and the boom of science fiction in the 1940s to make up stories it thought would lead people to it, Foundation researcher Dr. Richardson had a hunch that there was something else going on. He next spoke to Dr. Gold, the other Air Force scientist who had been studying the egg-shaped meteorite. He asked him to describe SCP-1051's first victim, Dr. James. Dr. Gold told him that Dr. James was obsessed with his job and that spread into his personal life. 
He was a real sci-fi nut. Dr. James apparently loved B-movies, especially ones about aliens and UFOs. He was convinced that the government had both in their possession already, and his research on the strange, egg-shaped meteorite only added to his confidence in that fact. Had SCP-1051 somehow absorbed this knowledge from its first meal here on Earth, and was now using it as a way to lure in new, inquisitive prey? Dr. Richardson thought it may go even deeper than that. When he played a recording of the first conversation he'd had with SCP-1051 for Dr. Gold, the one where 1051 told him it wanted him to bring food, Dr. Gold was left shocked. The voice he was hearing belonged to Dr. James. SCP-1051 remains in the Nevadan desert, and its area is patrolled at all times by no less than 20 Foundation personnel in uniforms that resemble those worn by members of the United States Air Force. They are authorized to shoot at intruders, but not with the intention to kill, instead, only as a means to scare them away. Should any intruders come within one kilometer of SCP-1051, they are to be detained and administered Class A amnestics. Since SCP-1051's primary danger stems from its ability to spread false information, the SCP Foundation's main containment efforts have been focused on stopping its broadcasts. Agents are to respond to any civilian rumors or questions about SCP-1051 with denial and ridicule, to make it clear that these are nothing but stories and that the person is stupid for believing them. Should they exhibit any knowledge beyond the normal myths and rumors, the application of Class A amnestics is also permitted. Any satellites orbiting near 1051's location are to be monitored for interference to their transmissions, and if any antenna with an unknown purpose are discovered within a 10-kilometer area of the building, they are to be destroyed or surrounded by a Faraday cage. SCP-1051 may not be able to move, but its ability to reproduce and the difficulty that the Foundation still faces in stopping its spread of disinformation has led to it being classified as Euclid, and research into its origins and biology are ongoing. Now for another anomaly that you never want to step inside, go watch SCP-002 The Living Room, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.